Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to Crow's Nest. I'm here with my homie. Welcome. Welcome. It's time. We'll pace some stuff. Yeah, it's time to pace some shit out, dude. Let's talk about RTS combat pacing. I'll have you know, V, you can't see this, but I can. And I'm very upset that I can see this, but it's a screenshot of a Warcraft 3 battle, and that's what I chose for the thumbnail, so. Oh, go. wow. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty I wouldn't say pacing in Warcraft 3 is that great. No, yeah. Not it's, at all. It's, and it's also random. It's LOL so random. Well, yeah. we're going to talk about RTS combat pacing in this episode, if you couldn't tell. I mean, we don't usually do clickbait on the No Frauds Club, so when you see a title, it's pretty self-explanatory. But uh, we wanted to talk first about games that we have spent enough time in to really be able to zero in on their issues and zero in on also the things that are good about them to whatever degree there are. And, you know, we talk about how Warcraft 3 and Starcraft 2 are pretty bad games and how Brood War leaves a lot to be desired, even though it's the best we've seen released as a proper game. But... Despite that, you can still find things that you can say are, you know, at least like this trait of it isn't bad or this trait of it is even good or, or something is desirable about it or whatever. So it's not all uh, stupid necessarily. Like some of it is going to be useful to just examine. And so, yeah, I figure we can talk a bit about each one of those games, Brood War, Warcraft 3, and Starcraft 2, as those are the games that uh, I certainly personally have the most experience with. I know, Veek, you've got a bit of experience with some of the Age of Empires games and stuff, but I figured we would stick to games that we're both kind of familiar with, enough to be able to say, yeah, we've seen enough gameplay, we've played enough gameplay, like, we kind of understand yeah, how the I, game works. I think those are perfect examples, because actually, Starcraft 2 and Warcraft 3 are the examples of the extremes that I always use, because yep. Warcraft 3 is the... It's where, like, the, the highest TTK happens, and Starcraft 2 is where the lowest uh, TTK happens, so. Absolutely. And TTK being time to kill, so. That's basically what we're talking about when we are, like, th that's one of the things that we are talking about when we refer to combat pacing. It's yep. basically how long can your units stay, uh, like, actually contribute until they just die and you no longer have any control over them. Yeah, yeah. Well, time to kill is like the facet of individual units, but combat pacing as a whole probably refers to like you know you're thinking about how how long do battles last, broadly speaking, right? Yeah. Um, and you know sometimes that can be very volatile. Like we look at StarCraft Two, and if you're not hitting the space bar as soon as you get an under attack notification. And even sometimes then your units are dead. Like think about all the things that one shot. You think about like disruptor balls versus bio, and about well, TV, you know, all sorts of stuff. TVP like that. just been this thing for like many many years where uh, whoever just wins the caster battle. So mm -hmm. if you snipe, if you EMP the high templars, or if you feedback the ghosts, whoever yeah. wins that wins the battle because the Sionic storm is basically like really OP where it. And sorry of two especially because everything clumps and yep. the damage is eff effectively way more uh, powerful and little. So like it's really easy to just lose all your units or lose this like a significant amount of your army to a point where you can no longer really do anything. You're just at the uh, losing uh, position then. Well, the other thing, too, is that it's not even just that one matchup, because you think about Ghosts versus Zerg instantly killing things like Ravagers, Mutalisks, Swarm Hosts, Infestors. Maybe they don't instantly kill Swarm Hosts. They but did like something they kill a lot weird of now, where you have, like, a channel on the Snipe, which can be interrupted with any damage, yes. and the Snipe deals more damage. So they are actually now used to counter Ultralisks. <laughs> so, well, they're used to I counter see. all sorts of stuff, just because... The range is still high enough, and especially if you have like a vision advantage, although that's kind of hard to do versus Zerg with all the um, overlords and overseers and stuff. But especially if you have the surprise on the enemy, which again is sort of what we're talking about here, there's not really any time to react to stuff. You have to, yeah, like if you have good map vision, like StarCraft is a game where scouting and map vision is like super important because of the fact, in many ways, you can't really react to an opponent um, after they've already started. Like you have to be able to be there before the battle and be making choices before yeah. damage is exchanged in the first place uh, if you have a hope of actually surviving. And, you know, we're going to get to Cosmonarchy Brood War, our conversion of StarCraft 1, uh, because that's obviously this feeds into some of the changes that we've made there. We're also going to get to some, a little bit during that phase of discussion, we'll probably talk a bit about how we uh, 
what, what the things we want to explore in our first game and in our future games and, uh, you know, things that are a little bit different in that sense, as far as the combat pacing is concerned. But the like looking at StarCraft 2 specifically, you do have so many cases where you just end up losing your uh, a, gig a gigantic amount of your army, like you were saying, a significant chunk, a non-trivial amount before you even can look at it. And depending on what the spell actually is, if it's a disruptor ball or if it's a Psy Storm or a bunch of Colossal. Or a Baneling. Yeah, Banelings. Yeah, and I'm thinking of trying to think of something like for Terran, but I guess it would just be like the ghost sniper or whatever. It's like there can be things that hit you so hard that you lose more than just one or two units in that time, which would already, we would argue, be not very interesting and good. It's like you lose half your army sometimes uh, to this sort of thing. So uh, just that's the, what I've taken from watching a lot of pro play is that uh, if you ever get surprised by something, you are in such a, a deficit already just because you weren't the one responding. Yeah. You weren't the one aggressing. And it turns this thing like we we hear the term defender's advantage bandied about a lot in RTS discussions. And I don't think you have much of a defender's advantage in a lot of games that try to use StarCraft II as the example of, you know, good pacing or whatever, because StarCraft II benefits, like, you are so much favored as the aggressor, as the one who's the one, like, starting the attack or whatever. Like, to an extent, you you can maybe do something like Terrans do, where they put, put up uh, planetary fortresses at different choke points and stuff, and that can be your turtle play style or what have you. But for the most part, like you want to be the one who's aggressing. You want to be the one doing the first move. And th you don't want that to not be rewarded in an RTS, but you don't want it to be rewarded so disproportionately that there can't be a response. And yeah, you wouldn't want one uh, encounter to, to decide the game. Like, as an example, you were talking about scouting. One thing that is pretty common in StarCraft 2 is that uh, if, you, if you don't know a, a drop is happening and you will just have your army a bit out of position, you can just dramatically lose your chances of uh, winning yes. with just one uh, action from the enemy. So it's not like he uh, he did a lot of, like, he didn't achieve many wins, he just achieved one substantial one just because you didn't know and you, you were out of position. So, yes, that should be rewarded, but it shouldn't be... Like, it just has to be... Uh, it has to be considered that the reward should probably be proportional to the effort that it took. Yes. It shouldn't be that like one one tiny thing like a point and clink ability can just win you the game. That's really, really dumb. Well, you also think about it in terms of so you were basically touching on the idea of risk versus reward and like what's your investment, what are you getting out of it? If you're dropping eight marines into a mineral line and stimming and killing a bunch of workers or, or dropping, you know, hellions or widow mines or whatever, it's like, OK, well, you can drop all this stuff and you have this transport that like speeds up for a short period of time so that you can specifically do this, basically. A and, you know, that's not a crazy amount of investment compared to your entire resource line. Right. It's like yeah. the it, it, if that were to happen in a game that has slower combat pacing perhaps we would argue more appropriate combat pacing. We'll get to that later too. Um, I just think about it in the terms of like, you would not be as successful with as little investment. You would probably still get some reward because again, we want you to be able to be, you know, stack up some advantages. But like Vik is saying, we don't want you to just be able to win the game off of one single move without having already done some legwork and done some other good moves uh, leading up to that particular point. Yeah. So that's where I think a lot of the, the problems with StarCraft II's pacing comes from. And like you did allude to at the beginning when we were set talking about the differences between WarCraft III and StarCraft II, WarCraft III is on the other end of the spectrum, right? WarCraft III is very much battles take ages to resolve. Units have way too much health and way too little damage. You forget the fact, too, yeah. that like every unit has passive regen. Uh, I mean, I guess like uh, night elves regenerate at night and undead regenerate on blight. But humans and orcs just have passive regen. And oh, by the way, most of that regen stat is not like a consistent value from what I remember. Like it can be different on a per unit basis and that information is not exposed to you anywhere. And even if it was, how the fuck are you going to remember that anyway? <laughs> so like a lot of real, real heavy complexity, you can refer back to our previous episode about complexity. Uh, a lot of complexity is in Warcraft 3 between the random damage, the armor system that they have that's super conf confusing and convoluted. The fact that it uh, does a percentage-based block of damage, so it's way harder to keep track of on the average hit, especially since every hit has a random like ratio. Or yeah, whatever, I so. would be 
Like, I feel like the biggest offender is that every damage type interacts differently to every armor type, so you yeah. just have this combinatoric explosion of, like, weird percentages, because they are not ever, like, even, like, it's not 25, 50, or 75, or, like, even 33, or something. It's like, oh, you just get 27 less damage, or, like, 13% less damage, or yeah. something random, so it's sort of, it's really hard to, like, intuit all of the different interactions in that game. Yeah. And on top of that is also random, so it's not consistent at all. Yep. And maybe because of the fact that all of those really bad, ugly game design traits are being leveraged, it, it, I, I think maybe the fact that the combat is so slow kind of makes them less impactful. Because like, if the combat is fast enough, like if, if the combat was anywhere closer to like the Brood War or even StarCraft II level of uh, pacing, you would see these random swings in damage and these random you know, or like seemingly ran effectively random, really hard to yeah. internalize rules. They would have such a like pronounced effect on the way that the game worked that you would be in a really confusing spot in most battles. You just wouldn't be able to follow what's going on. And I mean, the game isn't super readable either, but you just look at the fact that because the battles take so long to resolve, it actually does like allow you to kind of parse a little bit what you can expect, uh, especially at a higher level. I mean, the and the, and the anecdote I always share is when I was watching Grubby play a game and his like instead of doing anything skillful with his hero, he just yelled at, into his microphone, "Come on, crit!" And it's like, bro, <laughs> why why is that what a player has to do? I mean, like he was also microing and doing stuff, but like just the fact that you, that's your fucking control flow is like, yeah, let me just l let me test for the skill of whether or not the player rolls their dice correctly. I think that's a great idea. So uh, that definitely f messes up with pacing. Uh, and you do see certain units and certain hero compositions be picked because of the fact that they can either like, you know, for a long, long time, Night Elf was super dominant and you would just use the uh, Wizards of the Talon and Cyclone enemies <laughs> and just like CC them for like 40 seconds or whatever the fuck it is. Uh, so, like, CC. Yeah, that's a pretty silly So many bad too. design decisions. I think. Crowd control, randomness. Yeah. Uh, abilities that you types. can put onto auto cast so that they automatically yeah. do the thing and then yeah it's it definitely gets silly you know i guess as a, a short aside i think the auto cast feature is basic it's kind of like what fifth edition D D tried to do with casters by giving making it so that they could use their cantrips uh like as a basic attack almost so you could fire like mm. a magic missile or whatever instead of having like wizards in previous editions of D D had to use like crossbows or something when they were out of spells and I think they were basically trying to, like, allow you to tap into the fantasy of playing as a, a magic user. And, like, I think maybe that's what they were doing with the priest or whatever, where it's like, yeah, he this guy heals. So, of course, he's just going to heal. But they had already achieved a similar um, superior result with the, the medic in uh, Brood War. So I'm kind of confused why they went the autocast route in that sense. It's like... If that's just the behavior of the unit and that's like the main thing they do, then isn't that better than like I have to interact with this unit and babysit them so they don't spend their energy? I guess the medic is actually kind of a flawed example because in practice yeah, they had energy. They had energy and they had restoration and they had optical flare. And I guess you weren't really ever using most of the, like you definitely weren't using optical flare and you very rarely were using restoration. So most people just yeah. treated them as heal bots and the energy didn't matter a huge amount unless like the medics survived a long time or whatever. Then they had a, more energy to bank up versus muta fights. Or, Brood War is its own silly, uh, has its own set of silly things. But I just look at that and I think like, I, I'm probably conflating it with the cleric in CMBW since that unit is more... It's like our, our version of it, and it doesn't have energy. It just heals, and it's like a whole consistent unit idea. Is like, oh, okay, yeah, it sort of could conceptualize that ability as a weapon, where it just yeah. targets allies. So you're a moving your allies, right? Pretty much. Well, we yeah. actually had that going in old Natar for yeah. um, one of the units. So you you exactly had the same idea behind it, and uh, it when targeted on allies, it would heal them basically, and so uh, you could choose to. Like, I think we had the AI set up so that they would prioritize healing the uh, MOBA players instead of their own units, but they would also hear the, heal their own units if they were in the area, and they would heal buildings and stuff. It's kind of funny. Um, and, yeah, so I just think about stuff like that, and I think, you know, I, I do wonder why uh, 
some of those abilities like the autocast stuff, if their goal was to make this unit really about healing, then you'd think they would have it be related to how they behaved by default instead of it being like, well, I guess the priest is really bad because it has two autocast abilities. It has heal and then it has inner fire. <laughs> so you choose which one to automate. It's like, why though? <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that game is really wacky. Um, there's builds in for humans for the like animal war training, max upgraded knights with uh, inner fire buff and a paladin with tier three, uh, div what is it, divine aura or something. Uh, and it, that basically gives them, I think it gives them something crazy like 11 or 15 armor. Yeah, it's because it's all of the stupid complexities of that game interact in a way where they just create a god unit. <laughs> It's just like yeah. you stack up armor, you stack up the buff, you make a really tanky unit with... Uh, like it's a tier 3 uh, unit from the, the barracks, barracks Yeah, think. the human barracks. Yeah. So it's a strong unit without the buffs uh, anyway. So. Yep. And when upgraded and also with all the buffs, it's just so uh, just goofy how you make a god unit i guess the way the reason that even happens is because you have upkeep so it's yep. better to do that instead of just have a big army but well you'll see this even in starcraft 2 and other games that have a supply cap because your army quality matters a lot when you're at that max supply like a terran army that is ghost tank versus marine tank or whatever is like way different in terms of how much damage it can dish out and how lethal it is in certain compositions like if you have ghost tank versus protoss or even versus zerg it's like really hard for them to beat you whereas if you only have marine tank like maybe you can use banelings or something so like what i mean by that is if you ever have upkeep or if you ever have a supply cap you are basically putting a similar decision in the player's boat which is like Stay, uh, stay, like, use these kinds of units in the late game, especially because they are like v their value, their worth of like their supply cost or whatever is like translates over. I really, the upkeep system is such a mess and such a disaster. And it's really sad that like the most of the people who have talked about it, it from the design team have said stuff like, yeah, we just couldn't make the game, the engine work properly, basically. Like, we couldn't make it performant. So we had to, you know, reduce the number of units on screen. And, yeah, well, it kind of makes sense when you think about it like that. But it's such a bad outcome. And, unfortunately... Well, even then, I feel like I would not come up with a system that introduces so much stupid complexity. I would probably just try to make it... Uh, I mean, just arguing for a cab is not that great of an idea anyway, so just make a better engine, but if that's not possible, then try to do something that still allows you to like, express meaningful depth instead of having a system where banking your money is the correct play. <laughs> so dumb. Yes. I mean, in CMBW, you bank money to tech up, but there's actually a trade-off there where it's like, I, I'm not spending my money because... Um, if I do that, well, if I don't spend my money, then I don't have units on the field, and so my opponent can abuse that, right? Like, there's, like, a push. It's point. like the concept of tempo, right? Yeah, yeah. You either you have something now or you have yeah. more later. You decide, uh, depending on what you need. In Warcraft 3, you're just never allowed to get more, so <laughs> you just float the money. <laughs> it's really yeah. silly. Like, it just devalues the whole idea. I mean, resources also deplete and so on and so forth, so it gets a bit silly pretty quickly, but... Yeah, I don't know. I think um, I'm looking at, you know, I'm thinking about like how Warcraft 3 handles combat pacing and how a lot of it is, you know, very, it's very centered around these battles taking a long time. And uh, your micro is also not super easy in that game. And not that you should necessarily make your game easy, obviously. But what I mean is it's very clunky. Units really are really bad at pathfinding, really bad at navigating uh, battles. And it just ends up being this thing where it feels very sluggish. Like, as much as StarCraft II is, like, told to everybody, is like, oh, look, at this, this is the benchmark for modern RTS controls. It's so smooth and everything. And, like, mm. we've seen past that, obviously. Uh, Warcraft Three is, like, very much the opposite. I know some people think Brood War is really clunky and stuff, and certainly there's parts of that that I can agree with. Like, I think the pathing should be better. But 
Warcraft three is way more in my opinion. And, and because it's only not again, like so many of the game's problems are harder to see because of how slow the combat is, where if you made the combat pacing more appropriate, you would actually end up in a situation where it would expose the rest of the faults of the game. And we've actually kind hmm. of seen that a little bit with Brood War anyway, although it's been in the reverse where we fixed a bunch of things and these are more technical, like we fixed a bunch of order timers and we fixed a bunch of things related to like, yeah. you know, diff- various checks and various balances here and there. I and think the biggest clankiness of Brood War comes from like how the selection mechanic works where it doesn't, uh, like in Warcraft 3 you don't have that, so you don't see that, but in StarCraft you first have the limits, and then if you select more units than you can select, then it will just select the units effectively randomly, so it's really clunky to just order stuff around very yeah. often. You have to learn mini games to, uh, to be able to work uh, through that, but uh, Warcraft 3 doesn't have that, so maybe it doesn't feel as clunky, but the actual mechanics in Warcraft 3 are way worse. You have, like, this formation uh, yes, yeah. toggle that is enabled by default, completely destroys unit movement, and there's just a lot of bad design and, uh, uh, like, fundamental mechanics of Warcraft 3. Not, not even the stati- uh, statistical stuff that we talked about before, but it's just, like, how, like, buffing works and stuff yeah. like that, so... So I think that both Warcraft 3 and StarCraft 2 are good examples of what not to do about RTS combat pacing. I think Warcraft 3 yep. is much too slow for it to be particularly engaging, not to sound like a Zoomer who only watches TikTok videos or whatever, but like I really don't need to, you know, wail. It's sort of like the grind you experience when you're playing a, a insert RPG here, like I don't know, God of War or whatever. It's like let me have this uh, fight against this guy and he's got like 30 health because I'm on the hard difficulty and, and normally he only has five health or whatever. And so yeah, of course he launches me. Again. Yeah, yeah, that too. Uh, or whatever the case may be, right? It just gets very silly very quickly. Uh, it's like that for Warcraft 3, but for an RTS. So you can imagine it's just like every unit does no damage to every other unit and they never die. So, I mean, I think somebody did actually math it out and it was like double digits of attacks for like a footman to kill a grunt. It was like a ridiculous number. So that's all you, that's probably all you need to know really. It's like basic benchmarks like that. But Starcraft two, on the other hand is much too fast. Like we already talked about, you don't really get an opportunity to respond to threats in a satisfying manner, especially if they're uh, pulled off against a human player. I guess maybe that's another thing we should note is that we are thinking about this from a, a perspective of somebody playing against an enemy who actually wants to defeat them. And that is usually only going to be true for people or something that people can relate to in the context in of playing multiplayer because the AI in campaigns is never really that competent. And even in skirmish mode is often very far behind the average player who is even tangentially aware of the you know basic RTS mechanics and, and multiplayer and stuff. So I think that when we look at it from that those terminology, it's like, it's important to note that because I'm I'm talking about how the combat pacing is really bad and maybe somebody has only played like the you know the campaigns on a, on hard difficulty or medium difficulty or something and they don't even know what I'm talking about because in their mind it's like well no it's actually fine because I can always respond to the threat when it's pinged on the mini map for me in the StarCraft 2 campaigns or whatever the fuck <laughs> and it, or you know yeah, the, it's and campaigns they never actually maintain an army they just attack wave here yeah. with scaling amount of units so it's not even like comparable it's just like it's like a prepared experience for you so you don't really experience the uh the ttk of like equal amounts of uh stuff without right. like dollars and stuff so or even like units getting really good target priority i guess on the higher difficulties they probably do do that and maybe then if you play yeah, on brutal you can experience the um the 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 something more corresponding to the TTK in that sense. But yeah, like I just think about the combat pacing in, in StarCraft two. And I feel like if you could actually respond to stuff, then for, again, if you make the pacing more appropriate, it exposes other issues that may, and in the case of StarCraft two, definitely are laying underneath. It's like, okay, now that I have more time to respond, I realize how often I'm spamming casters, you know, or something like that, right? Like that was one example that you gave earlier is like i'm winning the the caster battle of pointing and clicking on the enemy units <laughs> and it's like yeah. okay well and now i have more time to do that so that's more powerful or something right we could imagine that such a reality might exist if that uh change were to be made to raise like durability and lower damage or something so that could yeah, definitely and be then also just like that's not exactly like related to pacing but just making the thing not a point and something that you have to express skill to use mm. 
that also improves. I mean, it's not directly related to pacing, but it improves it because yeah, uh, it makes the dance between players way more uh, involved, and it's not no longer something that you just like after the initial encounter you just win or not. It's like it's something that takes some time to finish because like oh you might not hit the skill shot the first time so you might need to like dodge a bit or whatever and it's well there like, it you takes know, time more. there's a deep point here too that i think m many people probably haven't internalized and it's that if you make it so that battles take a little bit longer than starcraft 2 or you know a lot bit shorter than warcraft 3 or whatever say we imagine a, a, an ideal like baseline average combat pacing right where it's, it takes say like something like 20 seconds or 30 seconds for a, an early game battle to resolve as an example right so if it takes 20 seconds for this battle to fully resolve and that's with you know both players microing right um, that means that at some point you could maybe make that battle take a little bit less time to resolve by giving up on your end of the micro and then going back and doing some other task because, you know, it's an RTS, so you're also macroing. And then your yeah. opponent might still be microing. And so any time that you can glean from that basically means that even if somebody is decisively winning the battle, say they've actually won and they still have a bunch of units, depending on this map state and depending on where they are and stuff, they could very well have been... Uh, you know, it's microing their little heart out and then floating a bunch of money. So they could have actually been behind the eight ball in terms of yeah. the general pacing of how the game flows because you just no recognize that that was a lost fight and either pulled the trigger to try to retreat or just like sort of like or gave some some stock orders to your units and then went back to macroing and stuff. And it's like, yeah, if, if you're in a game where you're up against an opponent, a, a human opponent in this case, because obviously AI are pretty godlike at multitasking, the idea there is like, even if I win, I may have been over, you know, committing to the micro part. And, you know, obviously we're the idea being like, that's a, that's a point of like, as much as the term comeback mechanic is abused in modern game design parlance, I think about it. Like that is actually kind of a comeback mechanic. It's like my opponent had to have like commit so many resources, including their attention to winning the fight th that even though they won the fight, I can still be in the game and I can still come back. Like, it's not actually a huge I deal. I think the biggest change that increasing TTK does is it it makes the influence over what happens go to the player and its and skill of the player and not the circumstances of the situation or the game. And I think that's great. Sure. But then, of course, there's the other uh, side where if you go too high, like Worker Free, you just have not only a boring game, you also have situations where you can just like, you can retreat the army at any moment and you're not really penalized yeah. for that at all. The so. decision or mistake or whatever actually loses value and impact because, so you like you were just talking about how you wanted the player's skill to determine the outcome of the ma of the situation and not just and like- And not the circumstance. Yeah, not the circumstance, which is, the circumstance is StarCraft too, right? But also you don't want the decision you don't want the circumstance, especially if it was premeditated in some way, to mean nothing. You want it to inform the beginning of yes. the game's fight or that particular fight in the game. And then once that combat has begun underway with whatever the circumstance was, then, okay, now we can start to use player skill. And so, like, some part of that, you know, it's like in, in Counter-Strike to some degree, it's like you can have a really skilled mechanical player, but if the smart player positions himself to a point where he's always behind the mechanical player, the mechanical player has no chance because he's just going to get shot in the back of the head. He won't even have a sp uh, chance to react. So that's like one of those cases where you can, that's obviously from a different game and a different genre, but that's something that you can easily map onto this and say, Oh, okay. Well, now I can have a case where my player, uh, like, you know, I might, I might get into a situation where I think I'm advantaged, but I wasn't aware of my opponent's circumstance and their circumstance was actually better than, uh, like able enough to offset. Maybe my, maybe I micro yeah, better. It might be some like uh, push and pull in terms of like, oh, I have better tactics and I have better, and the other player has better micro. Yes. Or something. Yeah, exactly. So, I might, I might've had a really preserve. solid position in the map. And that led to the circumstance being favorable for me. But I yeah, still had to finalize it. Yeah, that free right? example, they would just walk away and not be penalized at all. Yeah, exactly. Or you would have to have, in order to comp come at that, you would have to have a lot of c crowd control, like in Snare and Cyclone and just like freezing yeah. your units, right? That way it's like, oh, I can still punish you even though I can't kill your unit uh, without all the CC. I can still like CC you and force you to fight or whatever. And your that's CC just is disgusting. Well, it's all point and uh, click, so that doesn't help. I know, but...
it's yeah, it's even worse in that example. But we should probably we should probably dedicate an episode on YCC is so bad. But it's it's really disgusting. It's like uh, it's just a control being taken away from you. And if it wasn't at the yeah. very least, if it took skill to set up, then that's something. But I think uh, most of the time, well, it then there's sure. no counterplay after the fact. So like it's like I don't know. I just dislike it a lot because it's like okay maybe you had counterplay initially but when you actually get hit by it it's like oh i can really i mean in terms of rts it's a bit different because you have many units so you still have something to do uh but well in warcraft like, 3 you don't have that many units so it's easier to get cc yeah, roll yeah, squad yeah. So. the uh I, th I think sometimes there is there's going to be cases where there's no counterplay after a thing is deployed, and that could be CC, or it could be like, I don't know, this guy brings a Star Sovereign to your expansion, and you didn't know he had Star Sovereigns, and you because you didn't pressure him, he was able to get that right. Like it can be, it can be stuff like that where it's more about like it's not really anything to do with unit control. It's like this guy just got an advantage, and he, because you weren't able to punish him or, or whatever. So I think that can be a big deal, and that's probably something that uh, should be noted anyway, because you were talking about how, like, the the only counterplay to skill-based crowd control is stopping the skills from, you know, stacking up and, and being set up yeah, correctly yeah, yeah. or whatever. But that's true for a lot of things in an RTS, so uh, thankfully you do retain full control of other units. And you'll also notice that, that like, Brood War has, like, ridiculously long stuns by default, like yeah. stasis and lockdown and ours are like four seconds max or whatever or eight seconds for well stasis yeah i feel like like even like if you would have like an action game or something and you would argue you'd want to argue that you want cc i assume it would need to be uh below half second uh per a cc probably baseline like 0.25 because that way you can still like mess with the other player you yeah. can like uh interrupt some stuff and whatnot and that might be valuable although i still feel like there are more deep ways of achieving that without taking control away like even like a stupid uh push mechanic or like a pull mechanic while it still technically like influences the other player's controls it's like way more interactive there's way more depth in the decision uh like the counter decision or whatever so well, in action but, RPGs, you'll often get hit, put into hit recovery, which is basically a stun. And that's more of an yeah, animation, yeah. so that probably feels more natural than, like, just standing there taking hits or whatever because you were stunned. Um, yeah. And, and it, you know, it feels like it's related to feedback of, like, getting attacked by a heavy hit or something to that effect. Uh, although I do think that games lean too heavily on hit recovery. Like, all of the Souls games yes. have uh, incredible delays in animations, and they feel super clunky as a result. And it doesn't feel like they will ever fix that. Like they, it, to me, it feels like that's a deliberate decision to repeatedly have that in the game. And you know, I'm obviously as a franchise, it's been incredibly successful. But I prefer my thing, my units, or my character, or whatever I'm controlling, to do what I tell it to do. Uh, you know, within obviously whatever the constraints of the game are. So if my if I, I'm supposed to be able to attack and I'm supposed to be able to roll, it would be nice to be able to do those things without having to wait for really long yeah. animations. I was time. actually thinking about how I would pace. That, that's something I thought about a while ago, but I was thinking how I would pace an action game. And actually, it's funny because I would want the game to be very high pacing, but also have high TTK. So where battles take a long time to resolve, but you actually need like very high APM to play it, and where it's like super dynamic, super reactive, where you don't really work with CC, you work with like positionality and different behaviors and stuff like that. Yeah, I think there's it's more interesting anyway when you have control for like the vast, 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 vast majority of whatever the game is, because without control you can't make decisions. So. It yeah. stands to reason that if there is going to be crowd control, which I still, I think I said this before, but on this episode, on the show, but I don't know why they call it crowd control because obviously yeah. <laughs> it's Stunned. not AOE. It's a, it's a stun. So if there's any loss of control abilities, uh, then that is really where you're getting into a stupid situation very quickly. Maybe ECC just means control cock. Control <laughs> cock. Yeah. Cock control. Uh, chaos control from Sonic. All over again. Yeah. 
But I think the I'm looking at the idea of, you know, like that that's sort of what Warcraft 3 had to do in order to combat the the thing you're talking about exactly. Like, well, if units can shrug off all these attacks, then we can just walk past enemies and go kill stuff and then walk out of their base. Like yeah, well, just sort of students. like in Yeah, it's sort of like in Brood War, you can just take like uh, there's like cases where you can take a bunch of Corsairs or Valkyries or whatever. You can go hunt overlord hunting and like there'll be Hydras attacking your units or whatever. And you'll just be like, eh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, we haven't really covered Brood War yet. I don't no, think. No, right? I want to cover Brood uh, War, but uh, I guess I can ask you some, to open this topic up because I have my own thoughts and opinions on the professional meta of Brood War. And I'm kind of out of touch with like the lower right. skill meta if there is one. So... Uh, but, but I don't know either. Yeah, <laughs> but, I am curious as to what your thoughts are on it because obviously I can talk, I can wax lyrical about. Brood yeah, War I feel like games. Brood War TTK is pretty low, but the way the game manifests itself usually, uh, I know you talked about it in BBT. I have uh, seen a, a bit of it, but it manifests very differently on the high level where people know what to do. But basically, the game is also like generally slower pace than other games too, like uh, than StarCraft 2 specifically, because of how like some things are like more clunky, like pathfinding or uh, maybe the tech tree or whatever. So the game is slower, but they are also like, uh, the TDK is generally pretty low, but there are also some like weird offenders where you have like, <laughs> you have like the example of TVZ where uh yes, you have low TTK, but you have Dark Swarm, which completely makes you unkillable for forty five seconds. I think. So. Yeah, and it's a very like it's a complicated game to think about, I guess. But it's generally, I think, it's lower than our CMBW revisions. But uh, I said lower. Yeah, I, yeah. I think TTK is lower. So. Right, as in but, our, our current model that we are experimenting yeah. with right now on pre-release is uh, higher TTK. Yeah, I would say so. The combat takes longer. But that's the thing about Brood War is that, like, you know, there's this narrative spun that, like, look at Brood War. It achieved, you know, pretty good uh, pacing of the early game and stuff. But then if you actually look at Brood War, guys, like, you can lose to two Zerglings in somebody's base. You can lose yes. to, you know, one Marine arriving when you didn't expect it. You can you can yeah, lose to all think... sorts of stuff. Like, even at the pro level, games are still sometimes decided. By the way, if you ever watch Zerg versus Zerg, you know for a fact that this is a shambolic excuse of a game. What the fuck is ZVZ in default StarCraft, dude? Can you yeah. explain it to me? <laughs> so, that's, like, just one example. But, like, yeah, I, I just think about stuff like that, and I'm like, okay, now that I recognize... It, it's not like StarCraft 2 had all the answers. I mean, StarCraft 1 had all the answers. StarCraft 2 definitely didn't have all the answers. Guys. It's not like Brood War <laughs> no. had all the answers this whole time. It's that, like what Vig is saying, there's a lot of elements of the game that are kind of held together by other things that are kind of actually yeah. not very interactive. Like Defilers with Plague and Dark Swarm, they are actually really broken units. The fact that Science Vessels irradiate units and kill anything with a point-and-click spell, that's really stupid. Probably shouldn't be in the game. Like... You know, and then there's another thing that uh, Brood War does that we no longer do. And it's basically the way the map control manifests in the game, because you don't have like powerful air units. You don't have uh, very many mobile powerful units either. So basically, when you siege up a position, it takes time to pu push up, which makes it uh, harder to actually execute on the other player once you have an advantage because like if you're Terran against Protoss you have to like unseage all your tanks and move them uh, forward which takes time and it's like I think that is also a big contributing factor to why Brood War TTK doesn't feel as low as it uh, really is statistically it's because the like the tactical part of the game is often way slower some of that is due to skills like Dark Swarm some of that is because of uh, that the uh, powerful units are not as mobile, basically. Well, I also think that the powerful units, I mean, for Protoss, it's definitely not true. Uh, you can definitely get some incredible mobile armies in the mid to late game. It's just that the time to kill is low enough versus something like sieged tank positions that your units are just going to melt if you 
attack without stasis field stunning all of the enemy tanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like when you really, again, when you start teasing apart, it, it's like, there's a lot of like, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're hard counters, although maybe that's copium and maybe they are hard counters, but there's a lot of things in Brood War that are like, you have this tool and then I need to get this tool to combat that tool. And if I instead pivot to this other tool, like carriers for Protoss, then you have to d ditch your tanks and go straight to Goliath instead and like hope that you can beat me. Uh, and then like, because you can't even use wraiths or anything with their missiles because I'm just going to build a, a single observer or whatever. And it's so you get all this stuff and it's like, because the tech tree is so compact, uh, the you basically have access to all sorts of everything as pretty much any race, it's like pretty easy for you to go around the corner and get whatever extra tool you need. And there's only so many tools in the game that like each one of them kind of has some way to be used as a counter to the other. It's a lot yeah. more based on execution than in other games. And that's pro that's the main reason I would say it's probably not a hard counter. Uh, but there's definitely some things in the game that are like more uh, questionable than others. So, I don't know. Yeah, I think it shall, it highlights like an important thing to understand that you shouldn't judge a game by the results themselves. You actually need to like put it apart, like yeah. reason from the first principles and see why some certain things are the way they are. And ideally, if you're making a game or uh, like uh, like saying what you would want from a good game or whatever, you would want to see uh, how can you like keep all the good without necessarily also take like accepting all of the bad from uh, a solution like Broodmore, right? Yeah, because you would think, like on the one hand, we're pretty big fans of the fact that they the the battles do have some time to react. Well. Yeah, Brood War has much more time, reaction time than StarCraft 2, even though the time to kill is still pretty low in many cases. It's just, I would say, yeah. like, because there's not that many choices in the whole game, it's, you know, you don't really get to experiment as much. Like, you probably wouldn't be able to say that with a straight face if you hadn't played CMBW or didn't know that CMBW existed, because after playing that and seeing that each race has like, you know, I don't even know how many units we have per race. Now it's like six, 60, 80. I, I can't remember. It's it maybe not that high, but it's, it's some really high number, right? Like all told, we sure, have 60 for Turan and Protoss and like 40 for Zerg, but I might be mistaken. By yeah. Now. Who knows? Whatever the case may be, it's, it's very large. So like, we got a lot of units, guys, and that means that there's a lot of tools. And sure, not all of them are fully integrated yet, but and like we're working on that part, but a lot of them are. And so you get all of these different options and you know, like there might be some things that to look into as a concept, like maybe mobile damage dealer needs to be less mobile or less damage dealing. And we kind of already started that with the latest round of revisions, which I guess maybe we can get into now, but I thought it was important to break down the other three games and really go into details as to like our thoughts on them. Brood War can definitely be improved, yep. even though it's the best of the bunch. Uh, and I think you can tell that just because of the fact that games can be incredibly volatile in the uh, in the early game, which is something, you know, everybody here will be familiar that we were trying to fix that in CMBW for a good while now. And I think we've been successful in the steps that we've taken. And now we have to think about like, okay, well, how do we just make sure that we pace combat out broadly speaking because it's not just early game that was suffering we had you know mid game fights would sometimes end faster than early game fights because of the damage scaling and so i guess broadly speaking the way that i would describe it is like we we obviously scaled the offensive power of units high quicker with the tiers than we scaled their durability so some with some exceptions units would generally deal more damage than like they would get more offensive power increased then they would get their de defensive power yeah. increased. So a lot of the defensive uh, like scaling was also from the armor, which is more effective against the lower tiers generally. Yeah. So. Yep. So what we ended up doing was spending a bit more time, uh, you know, increasing health, which affects uh, all interactions. Since uh, even if you ignore all the armor because of your armor pen or whatever, even if your unit has no armor, you're still going to be dealing damage to health at the end of the day. So we ended up scaling that up. Uh, pretty highly, and we dropped a lot of offensive power. We, you know, maybe re revised a bunch of weapons, but we also, for the weapons that we didn't get full revisions, we increased their cooldown, or we dropped their damage. We definitely dropped armor and armor pen uh, quite a bit in general, so that it's a little bit more concentrated towards the bottom end. And 
just made it so that 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 particular part, those two stats scale together in in many ways uh, slower. Uh, but broadly speaking, now you do get units that last longer in fights. And, uh, you know, if they're like the, the new Atreus is an example of a unit that's like sustained fire, sustained combat. It wants to last it longer in fights, right? It wants to, you know, it has like pretty meaty shields so that uh, it can stay alive. It's a very longer. interesting unit because it's it's pretty durable and it also has pretty high range, but it has lower uh, lower damage so than it used to. So basically, it's like a unit that you just like you roam around, you poke a bit, you like uh, you can like pretty safely do that without being very vulnerable. So I think it's a neat unit. It's just we probably. Uh, I don't know if you have adjusted it since the last front nine. I, I remember you were talking about it maybe being too too high for the stats board, but well, we have to yeah, we have to be yeah, yeah, yeah. spending a little bit of time. I mean, there's a f- a couple of adjustments that I was planning on doing anyway that I cover in the latest uh, episode of the Big Boys Table over on my channel with Iskatu Mask. So if you guys are interested in that stuff, you can always check yeah. that out. But the uh, some of the things that I said I was thinking about doing um, were like. It, if we actually implemented kinetic penetration as a rule from the concept that we have in Cosmonarchy Retail to CMW, where if your armor pen is not greater than the armor of the victim, then that uh, attack does not get, uh, that doesn't pierce the target, basically. So we have, the, for example, there's an infantry unit for the Terrans called the Cyprian. It fires two projectiles that do line trace damages, so they pierce any targets that they hit right now they pierce it regardless of armor which means that your front line can't actually defend your back line from their attacks anymore and this is a fairly recent change that we did to the unit and it's definitely made them feel pretty powerful uh and probably in in compositions and cases where we don't really want them to be super powerful but if we actually make it so that armored targets will absorb the bullet they'll still take the damage but they won't allow the bullet to pierce past them. Now your front line can actually absorb, fi- uh, you know, the fight versus the Cyprian. And that might be an interesting thing to explore uh, as an idea. It would be a very big change and probably a very big nerf at the end of the day. But it would allow positional combat to once I again. I guess come something back and... we haven't considered that I just thought of is what if what if each point of armor that you haven't pierced would just reduce the damage of the of the bullet, and then if the damage reaches zero, the bullet uh, like ends. Well, that's sort of how like how the old calculus worked, where it would deal one right. less damage for each target pierced. But at the end of the day, it's kind of awkward to know that information. Right. The calculus mm-hmm. at least only did four damage, so you knew it could only hit up to four targets. But yeah, you still it was only doing one. Like, it, what is the value of doing like one? Yeah, damage it's sort to of hard to intuit. Right? Yeah, like you're not really going to know how how damaging the projectile was based on just watching it. So uh, that can be pretty awkward, especially with. Uh, like if you have big units, like you got Izera cores and you're using them versus a line of Cyprians. Okay. That's like a little bit different because they're big units. So they, they're, it's probably not piercing as many, but then you think about like Zethra cores and it's like, Oh, okay. Each one of these Zethra cores is going to take one less damage from the, like, I don't even know how you would keep track of how many get hit or, and yeah, stuff. Right. And uh, so definitely playing around with something like that to make it so that positional, like, you know, you want to like good be uh, adept at target selection and unit positioning, and that can like be the target selection part is like in the middle of the game, and then you are in the middle of combat. The unit positioning is both the circumstance from our from from our earlier model that we were talking about, and also like in the middle of combat, you can reposition. Although there's obviously an APM cost and like maybe a, a damage uptime cost because your units might be moving instead of shooting, right? Depending on if you move them uh, between their attack cooldown right. or not. And so there's all of these elements, right, that like matter a lot more. And at that point, it's like you almost want the Cyprian, if we do go with the kinetic penetration idea, to like wrap around units that are tanks or maybe just try to focus them down and like, you know, abuse a case where like, oh, I managed to kill like the one Harakin that was in my way and now I can start piercing the back line or something like that, right? Like you, you might be able to do something like that anyway. And uh, it's just one of those. Yeah, I could definitely see about. like interesting parts about this. Like the only thing I'm like sort of initially worried about is that it could end up being a bit binary, where uh, like it's just eventually like you can't pierce uh, that much, and it's like uh, I don't know. But but yeah, there's definitely some interest, some depth to be expressed by that with positioning and other things. So it's pretty uh, yeah. exciting to think about. I also think that since we've 
result like we basically did a bit of a stat crunch and as a result armor and armor pen now default to baseline zero whereas before they were baseline one because we were trying to like preserve interactions from brood war like classic brood war but now we're just like we just embrace the fact that we're our whole whole new game even though it's still within brood war as a mod it's still very like people who play it know that's it's a new game basically it's like completely different but the uh, the fact that we decided to do that baseline thing means that now it's probably easier for us to fit in armor rends and stuff like that, or armor piercing, like armor penetration bonuses as like an aura or a stat effect or something. Yeah, it's pr- it's easier for us to fit those into the model because we don't have to have the extra cognitive load of remembering like, well, it has to be more than one or something because one is the actually basically zero. Like it's no longer the case now, so that that's easier. If if you're ever struggling with numbers. See if you can reset it to zero or close to zero. That's my general advice. It's like uh, Reagan Burns in his interview with us talked about how it, like getting plus 100 HP is not as interesting as getting plus one HP. Because if like in Mario, if I get one extra HP, that means I can ignore an enemy entirely. Or that was like the example he gave, right? Because like normally touching an enemy is death. But if you get one extra health, now now I'm basically invincible from, from one. It's like a completely fundamental difference with how it works or whatever. And so the more you can get to like stat increases being impactful again, the better. And we were at a yeah, spot I where think it wasn't it's really very... that impactful. I think it's very important part of like expressing identity of a thing to have very significant few significant things about it instead of having many insignificant things yeah and i feel like most of the new games do the latter where they just have a lot of complexity with like oh this item gives you like 10 different stats one of it is like three percent resistance to poison and whatever and you don't really you can't really intuit what that item is gonna do for you and it like makes the identity of the thing very confused and the other example is way better where you have like Maybe you have an item that gives you uh, just one statistic and it gives you a lot of it. Then you know that, oh, I want this. Like, I want a damage item when I'm a damage dealer or whatever. And the same applies to units where if if every unit has one armor pen, then why not just have them have zero where it's mm-hmm. like you just remove the complexity from it yeah, and absolutely. you allow the units to specialize into something where... Like, some unit will have a lot of armor pen, and some others won't, instead of having it be everywhere and yeah. just muddying the water. The other, some, a couple of the other, like, quickfire things I was definitely thinking about. I mean, we, we talked about this privately, Veek, but uh, if we converted Mind Tyrant Tyranny to a projectile instead of it being point-and-click, that would probably be nice. Like, that kind of is in keeping with our topic of point-and-click spells being yeah. kind of stupid anyway. Um and then there was also, I was talking about this with Mask, again, on the Big Boy table. If we made it so that the Acantor la- launched its plasma shell, um, the if it, if it detonated on impact with any target, then you could actually have some interesting control to do, where it's like, oh, I have this, like, I can use this Maverick as a sacrifice to kill, to get rid of this before it blows up on my shit, or whatever. And then it's like, becomes more of a positional unit. I thought that could be pretty neat, since right now, if you're specifically using the Acantor versus something that's really immobile, you don't have much of a much counterplay, like if it's a building yeah. or, you know, but it, it would open up another avenue where you have to be a little bit more decisive. And again, we don't want to like make it so that the unit is impossible to use effectively. It's more like the unit gives you a lot of power in accordance with like the drop example in StarCraft 2 and you get like this risk versus reward discussion. Uh, mm-hmm. Now you can invest really good target selection to get a lot of value or you can invest maybe sloppy target selection to get less value, and your, or your opponent can invest a lot of AP. Yeah, the, Cantor in, is a yeah. funny example because we were talking about how like the pacing of the game improved and whatever, and then and then I saw Mask play against Kian, I believe, and he used the Cantor, and the one a Cantor killed like twenty workers. So. <laughs> yeah. Pretty so, funny. It can be pretty impactful, man. I'm just I'm telling you, but. Yeah, I think uh, also that probably helps them out with the, how aggressively they destroy stacked units. If they impact on contact instead, then naturally they're going to hit like the one unit. They're going to hit probably splash some some of the stacked units too, but they won't splash them with the same amount of damage, right? Because it won't be on top of all of them. So that's there's just a bunch of things there that I think would be pretty neat. As uh, yeah, can we? I guess another note that we wanted to mention is that. 
uh, we think of all this like combat pacing also in relation to like economical and sure, tech yeah. pacing. It's just not something we'll cover very deeply in this episode because they just deserve their own episodes eventually when we uh, come up to that. But it's very uh, like broad topic. But yeah, it's definitely something that we uh, have thought about and even adjusted for because like you can see all the economical changes that we did in CMPW with like. Oh, workers have higher train time. Oh, there's like mining uh, uh, diminishing returns from each node and some other changes that we did. So yeah, that's definitely something that relates and that we keep an eye on. So yeah. Yep. I think it it would be a little naive to suggest that you can uh, like, I mean, that's sort of something I talked about at the very beginning. If you fix combat pacing, whatever the fix means in this instance, either making it slower uh, than StarCraft two or faster than Warcraft three or more interesting and nuanced than Brood War or whatever. The ideas within there is that this will just allow you the, it opens the floor for you to do more interesting things with combat, but it also will expose other issues that you may have. Uh, and that's true of yep. anything that like, there's a bunch of things that supply did, for example. And when we removed supply, we probably knew at least more than half of the things that supply did on some level of like fundamental conceptual level of understanding it through analysis. But then there's a bunch of things that we didn't intuit fully or whatever. And that would be like, oh, it slowed down your, uh, you know, acquisition of early game units. Because yeah, we just like didn't stuff. realize yeah. some things would become an issue without that because that was always uh, an assumption when we played and it just became apparent that it's yeah. something that we need to adjust a bit. Yeah. So although that's like a long time ago now, but that's a good example in general of like, there's going to yeah. be, the systems are all interconnected, even if it wasn't a deliberate interconnection made by the designers there's these interplay between the systems that could be discovered could be falling out of that complexity naturally or whatever but it could also be yeah, it's like a it's like a butterfly effect technically one hp could change everything about the game sure. it doesn't necessarily have to but it could so yeah i think generally speaking it's pretty important to um it's just important to remember that like all of these systems are interconnected, as you're saying. And so changing one thing, even if you think you know what it's going to do, is going to do a lot more than that. And it's good to just accept that and then roll with like the discovery of what comes next, right? And that's all you really need to know, I think. Um, as a general rule, it's probably uh, in, a, in a pretty solid position. So now that we know that uh, CMBW has been adjusted and we know in the ways that it is, uh, it has been adjusted... Uh, is there something else? Oh, yes, of course. There's the discussion question I wrote for this episode. So uh, every now and then I'll, I'll get an idea for a question that kind of encapsulates the true essence of whatever this podcast is about in that given episode. And so uh, today's discussion question is, is there an ideal pace of combat or would we be interested in exploring faster and or slower pacing in our various games? And what I mean by this question basically is, you know, is there like one true pacing or is it all going to be contextual like would we maybe discover some magical formula that we think we can put to every single game as far as the pacing goes and at that point like combat pacing would be like a, a constant throughout our games yeah. right or is it sort of like what we were just talking about with the interconnectedness where you really just need to adjust it based on everything else you know pacing of tech acquisition pacing of you know, uh, economics and how fast the economy scales up. And like in a game where, for example, as a more concrete example, in a game where you harvest resources slower, does combat also must like, it doesn't have to be slower in, in a game like that, just because otherwise the game yeah, might expose scale, some volatility. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. The, the game might be overly volatile in terms of combat to the point where you can spend like five minutes building up to your first engagement and then your first engagement can end in, you know, 20, 30 seconds, but then so can the game perhaps like if the combat doesn't last long enough. So like, this is sort of like, we don't necessarily need to have a definitive answer here, but what right. is that kind yeah. of the case? Or I or feel like what do you think? my like initial intuition is that there's definitely some like desirable range of the pacing where like all uh, like all answers in that range would be like correct decisions although probably very different implications would uh come from them and there's also a range of pacings that you would never want to have which is like start have to work are free and uh it's definitely very nuanced and complex it's like 
Because, like, everything about the game impacts how this works and pacing impacts how every other system works. So yeah. it's, like, something you have to, like, analyze on each example. But I do feel like there's, like, an ideal pacing. And basically, like, a rule of thumb would be to... Uh, like we discussed with the circumstances and skill expression, we, we would want to find a golden middle where... Uh, you can actually the battle in battles. You can actually express your skill and stuff, and uh, it's like not something that's just left to circumstance or uh, where you can like where you can like corrupt the essence of the game in some stupid way, like the retreat army example, or whatever. Yeah, I, for sure, we don't want the game to be <laughs> off balance in any one of these aspects, right? But I think it's kind of interesting that this question was asked and posed after you brought up the whole interconnectedness thing. Because the more I think about that angle, the more that seems to be the truth to me is like, you definitely, like you can at least use past ideals that you've uh, achieved in other contexts. Like, you know, we achieve some kind of ideal. Uh, say, say we, you know, once everything is, the dust is settled with the changes to CMW, it's really solid with the combat pacing. Okay, then we can learn that. Like, we kind of know the formula in, f like, the, the at least we know the formula that worked for CMW. We kind of know, like, the balance of different tools and stuff. Now, we go into a game that maybe takes longer to tech up, longer to, you know, harvest economically, is a bit slower, uh, while the combat maybe also needs to slow down a little bit, or... You know, maybe some other things need to be taken care of if we want to achieve a similar pacing. And and it, maybe it's not even a good thing to achieve a similar pacing. Maybe it has to be different, right? And so I think, you know, for sure there's, like, another way to ask this question would be, what would have to, what, what, what would have to be true about a game for it to have StarCraft II's combat pacing, but still be good? Or WarCraft III's combat pacing, but still be good? Like, I feel like, again, sort of similar to what I was saying at the beginning, the preamble, it might not really be possible for us to say that nothing about those combat pacing bits are good. Like at least the Warcraft three cases, you get a lot of time to react and the Starcraft two cases shit happens really fast and decisions have a huge impact. I guess another thing that there is to consider is just uh, the general of the game, because like mm -hmm. I gave that example of an action game that would I, wa I, wa I would want to make where uh, there's like, a very high time to kill, but the game is very dynamic and uh, mandates a lot of APM and is very like interactive and yeah, whatever. Then maybe then the ideal time to kill is like maybe it's work at free level or whatever. And uh, yeah, it's just like it very much depends on what the game is about and what it uh, needs to have. And I'm not sure what kind of RTS uh, game it would have to be for a Warcraft free. Uh, or StarCraft to TTK to be a sensible. Because I imagine like if you would want StarCraft 2 TTK to be sensible, you would probably need to make the game be very much more about like remaxing and stuff. But maybe, maybe the only thing you need is just removing the supply cap. I don't know. But it's like it, it definitely right. feels like the pacing of the game itself would have to be way higher in the example of StarCraft 2 where you would just get more units and stuff. And in the Warcraft 3 case, you probably would need to make the combat even more interactive and dynamic. So you need it's to actually get rid kind of, of a funny. bunch of other things like cycle. Like you need to get rid of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the stuns and, and stuff that does loss of control and stuff that like basically you'd have to find a different reason for units to not just ignore each other in the middle of battle. Right. right yes. Yeah. Uh, it's like just some depth that you need to add, and maybe then it's good. But I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure if that's uh, like it's an interesting thought experiment. Yeah. But I'm not sure if it's that interesting to actually do in <laughs> yeah. terms of RTS. Yeah, sure. No, I'm with you. I mean, I personally like even when I'm asking that question, I'm kind of like there's a lot of doubts in my head. Like, bro, is this really? really going to be what we do here? Are we really going to try to like find a way to make Warcraft 3's pacing or Starcraft 2's pacing good? Because like I'm already so against the uh, the shortcomings that they have, right? And so, yeah. but it's important to think about this in the terms of like all of the systems connected to each other. Like if you make the combat pacing exactly the same as Warcraft 3, can you make that interact interactive? Or is it just completely flawed as a get from the get-go? If you make it as fast as Starcraft 2, can you make it 
po- is it possible to make it have defenders advantage without being super cheap? Is it possible to restore an element of being able to react and, and, and whatnot without somehow being like stupid in, in whatever way or like what, what, what can you do in that particular sense? If you're even trying to do that, I think we're not going to attempt to get either like close to either of those, like the, the CMBW combat yep. pacing that we've settled on for now seems to be a, a step in the right direction. Maybe it should even be slower. We'll have to wait and see. I think our first game is going to be markedly slower, but still nowhere near Warcraft three, uh, just because we are planning on a slower, um, like harvest, like economic state and stuff. So it kind of makes sense to just scale everything back in terms of the, the pacing just to see how that looks. But you know, Onatar, Cosmonarchy Retail, these are all modeled very heavily after our work in, in Brood War. So it only makes sense for us to sort of imagine that the pacing of combat as well as the pacing of other things would probably be very similar. For CM Retail, you could definitely get away with faster pacing, or you could even go the other way and say, fuck it, dude. If you, It's going to be even slower for like the tech pacing specifically. Like, oh, you wanted to get to tier 10. Well, I hope you got a couple hours, buddy. <laughs> like that could actually be a thing we do. But of course we would have to see, like there was a, a question asked on our discord server a while ago. That was like, what is, what is the ideal match time? And it's kind of a weird question because like, in my mind, I just want a good match. And ideally it's possible to have that no matter how long the game is. Uh, if it's between two skilled players, the, the push and pull and the drama can be in like how they fight each other. And maybe that ends in 10 minutes or maybe that ends in two hours. And as long as it's like them both trying and then both like giving it their all, it can be quite entertaining and yeah, quite interesting as long definitely. as there's a lot of depth. Um, I was, so, yeah. I remember typing to you, writing to you a private message that uh, after we were talking about some like uh, pacing and like tech tiers and whatever, I, I, I typed to you that, oh, I feel like probably the best um, like average ma- baseline match uh, duration would probably be like between 20 and 30 minutes and then anything that goes below would ideally be from like something very skillful like some really amazing beautiful execution on part of Mm -hmm. one player that made it happen and then the longer games would just be games where there's a lot of push and pull and there's a lot of like uh like there's ba- basically be- it's b- basically between two players that are like super equal and they also like it just went to a yeah to b- become like a very high the st- scale the game, stylistic so. uh matchup or whatever was perfectly set up for these two players to equalize each yeah. other for a while before one of them finally breaks through i mean then it matters way more like in the pl- watching counter strike again another analogy from that s- sector is uh when you get to the point where it's overtime or multiple overtime on a map, especially if it's in a best of three series or something, and it's like the last map of the series and this every round means more, the longer the game goes on. It's such a uh, crazy rush when the game actually ends. And it means all that much more, way more to the, to the people who win and also to the people who lose that. I think if you were to analogize that to a, a, you know, a very long RTS match, like nobody wants to lose a two hour banger. No, nobody wants to be on the loser losing side of that. Yeah, like definitely. nobody wants to shake the hands. They're of their just, just doing a co- ap- apocalypse from the Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's this mechanic we think... that uh, allows uh, j- briefly to explain apocalypse. It, it's like yeah. the idea basically is if the game seems lost, there's still something you can do to force a tie. It's actually inspired by chess. Uh, you can force a draw by doing uh, an apocalypse. And it's not really a draw in terms of your match rating or anything like whatever our equivalent of ELO is, uh, you'll actually get a slight increase and they'll get a slight decrease because it's just sort of the same thing about like, if you draw versus a player of a lower ELO than you, then you actually lose a little bit of ELO and they gain a little bit, but it's not as bad as if you lost to that player. Uh, in in this case, we're thinking of whoever, uh, precipitated the apocalypse such that they basically force the draw. That is the player who gets like the slight increase or whatever. Uh, but obviously that could also be attenuated by like, well, if you were really highly rated compared to your opponent and you had to force Apocalypse, then maybe you don't get any match rating. I don't know. We can figure that out later. That's like a secondary point. But that, yeah, it was inspired yeah. by the chess draw mechanic and how that all worked. It gives you something to fight for, even though the game, the victory seems out of your reach, right? You can still do something that is interesting and that will give you some sort of broad 
uh, you know, improvement. Um, but also it's like a, it's a really, I mean, there's a very thematic novel thing. You're like blowing up the planet. That's why it's called apocalypse. But there's also like, you're still playing an RTS during that time. And so you're still like doing purposeful tasks and engaging with the game, the core gameplay of the game. And, uh, engaging with an opponent who does actually want to beat you. So I feel like there's a lot of potential yeah. there. It's just a question of like, you know, th there's many ways where that could go wrong. It's just, but I, I, I feel yeah, like there's something like... so cool about that idea that you are still able to not win, but like half win or whatever, yeah, right. you know? Yeah. So I think there's like something funny about how it could work because it seems like something that would be pretty high tier or whatever, or pretty involved. Yes. And Very expensive. Uh, it might actually be something that breaks ties, funnily enough, where you, if you have a tie and yeah. there's just uh, a tie on the map and you can break it, then this could be a tie breaker, but it results in a tie. So it's really funny in, the, in that sense. But yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there and I, I like how it where it might go, but uh coming back to what we were talking yeah. about which was what was it what were we talking about i don't remember <laughs> we we're talking about the, talking about how we're going to slow the pacing down in our first game and how we we're but we're also like really hell-bent on the uh general model that we've achieved with cmbw we're talking about tech pacing we're talking about how we might like Oh, we were talking about match length. That's what it was. It was like 30 minutes. Oh, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. So what I was, uh, what I wanted to say is that we just need to be very careful that the longer matches aren't uh, boring. And yeah. the reason that they are long is because they are actually interesting. So you'd want to sort of like ensure that like internal rule of like like implicit rule of the match length is that the longer matches be happen because there's a lot of interesting gameplay and not because it's just like an uninteresting tie. So that's well, definitely something. We, we can influence that as designers, but you have to remember that people do some really silly things in, in our games and in games in general, and we can't control that. So if Mesk decides to cockroach inside his opponent's natural... And yeah. his opponent never finds it, and then Mesk is able to maybe win after it being like, you know, an hour of gameplay. And I just have to, that wasn't even the case that happened when this happened. But if I'm doing a cast over of a match and I have to basically do a podcast while I wait for the battle to finish, then that's not really the game's fault necessarily. That's probably more like familiarity with the players and stuff. So, right. I mean, sure. it could be the game's fault. Like, it could end up being like, oh, I can't breach this. I mean, if he did that and that, it's interesting and it takes one hour, that could be really cool, but. I could definitely see where maybe it wouldn't uh, be that interesting if the game was just like a long, like long, successful contain, except it took really long to resolve. <laughs> that could be uninteresting. Yeah, if, if there was nothing that the player who was uh, able to contain the opponent um, could do to, to end the game sooner. Like, if it wasn't a skill issue, basically, then that would be definitely a game issue. And even if it is a skill issue, if that happens all the time, then maybe there is something that could be redesigned or adjusted, right? So it's definitely good to yeah, keep that in true. mind, basically. is like, are the games going long? I mean, it's the same thing as the short games, right? Are the games going long because of player skill? Or are they going long because of the game design? Like, it's probably a, a combination, but, like, is it something that should be looked at? And if the games are yeah. going super short, is it a big skill differential? Or is it, you know, the game needs to be a little bit less volatile? One thing we didn't really even talk about is by making the early game a bit less volatile and by making combat take a little bit longer to resolve, we're actually opening the game up. And that's the real, like, hey, our game is a little more accessible now. Like, that term is fucking abused. But in the context of, like, everybody wants to make their RTS genre more accessible to the average player, well, one way to do it is making it so that the game scale takes a little bit of time to scale up. Like, I know you, people are afraid that Zoomers lose interest, but if they can at least, like, you know, respond to being attacked and it takes a little bit of time, like, they're in the game for a little bit, they don't just get stomped in, like, five minutes, then that's going to go a long way towards them being able to understand the game, at the very least, right? So... I feel like that's that goes a long way towards uh, making well, the I game more approachable. If, if you you're using way. the example of zoomers, if you actually make combat take longer, that's actually probably more uh, more that they can pay attention to. Right? So <laughs> that might actually be good for them. No, they but, just need yeah, they need uh, to watch uh, anime on their second monitor while they play so that they don't lose so interest. Still. You know, they they need to uh, you know ask for. They need where to the, have a casting every second. Uh, where's the loot box store? Does anybody yeah. Know? Oh yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. 
Yeah. You need to reward them with some free <laughs> dopamine. <laughs> so dumb but you know what that's uh i think that might be that is there anything else you wanted to cover before we move on to our chad questions hmm i think that's it it's a pretty good topic pretty good uh setup we were actually i should note we were originally planning on talking about factions like sub factions within an rts game uh but instead we talked about this and i only remembered we were originally planning on talking about factions like 30 minutes ago in the middle of the recording so that's pretty funny but Maybe that'll be episode 10. <laughs> so just stay tuned on that one. We, it gives us a little bit more time to figure out our uh, thoughts on it anyway, so it's probably fine. Uh, anyway, Chad questions. Uh, coffee is our uh, place of choice for you to support us. If you like to support the show and the uh, development that we're doing and the interviews that we're still trying to organize, even though uh, hasn't, it's been a while since the last one, and all the other stuff that we do, then you can go to code-v.com forward slash pronogo and week seven. Or you can just click the link in the description because that's easier than typing all of that. And you can uh, give us your money, basically. So uh, thanks to these people who... Yeah, thanks a lot, Chads. Yeah, thanks to the Chads who uh, donate to us and give us those threes that we use to buy coffee and other things. So let's talk first about Kian's question. Kian asks, what are your plans for the design of town centers? Will they only produce workers? Will there be forward outposts? Of the Zabalba races, which do you think will have the most outlandish concept for a town center? So there's a, obviously a bunch of questions in here, but the essence of it is that Kian wants to know about town centers and our town center design philosophy. And for people who might not be familiar, our idea of a town center is basically just like, what do you start with in a melee game? You know, in, in Brood War, it's like four workers and, you know, whatever it is, a hatchery, a nexus, a command center. So the stuff that you return resources to, and most often the stuff that generates the thing that you build workers with, in the case of Zerg, obviously they generate larva, or you're building workers directly from the structure in a more conventional sense. And that is basically what a town center is. And that's what Kian's interested in asking us about. So... There will definitely be forward outposts. Uh, that is something that I think, you know, actually Vic brought up the treasury earlier as an example. Uh, the forward outpost idea of like building this structure that it has less features than a bona fide, fully fledged town center does. Like in the case of the treasury, yeah. it can't directly train masons, but it can build an add-on that trains masons. However, the command center can also build that add-on. So it's not like it's like, basically they, it's like if you just had a command center, but it couldn't train workers directly that would basically be what the treasury is so it builds the same add-ons as the command center and you get it cheaper for cheaper than a command center a little bit faster less resources the idea is that it's a pacing play a tempo play and you can also use it for areas where you don't necessarily need to build a lot of workers anyway you can just transfer if there's bases on the map that are only have like a like gas only bases or whatever where you only need maybe four or six workers or whatever the case may be to actually harvest from them then you can drop a treasury there and just transfer the workers you don't even need to build the add-on to, to build the masons or whatever so i think that's been a great uh little flourish you can do obviously the uh, the Crucible is one example in uh, Brood War and CBW right now, but it's a little bit scuffed because of some silly stuff that we plan on fixing later in the future uh, due to how the internal system works for power. Then there's obviously Zerg just build macro hatches anywhere anyway, because that also doubles as their production. So forward outposts are a thing. They are probably going to be for every race. I can't really imagine a reason why they wouldn't, unless they were super ubiquitous like the Zerg and maybe they don't need them. Although I planned one for Zerg anyway, so we'll, we'll get to that. Maybe that'll happen. But I definitely think that when we're thinking about town centers, like the, the biggest thing for me about the town center is it, it really, in, it's supposed to be like something about it is supposed to magnify the race's thematic or encapsulate it in some way. It's actually why I think the Nexus doing, uh, providing a power field would be so thematic for Protoss because the Nexus by default doesn't do anything that's incorporated into the theme of the Protoss. Meanwhile, the Terran builds add-ons, right? The command center builds add-ons. Yeah, and, and has liftoff and the hatchery or hatcherosk in CMW builds, uh, obviously like trans spawns larva spreads creep and can mutate. And so like all of these yeah. things are related to the thematic of the race and like reflecting, uh, you know, the thematic of the race, the Nexus just has shields, I guess is like the biggest reach you can fucking pull uh, as far as like what it might be doing. That's related to the race's thematic and that's it. Right. And so I guess the fact that the, it, it builds itself because that's what all product structures do. But other than those two things, which are very, very minor by comparison, like, you know, then you have to factor in Zerg buildings regenerate and Terran buildings burn down and, and suddenly you're back to basically square one where like the stack of of things that these other structures do, like they, they don't really relate. So definitely look for any sort of characterization that is based on what these town centers do in addition to building workers, assuming they do actually build workers because I'm sure there'll be some that uh, don't. I, I plan a case where 
you you a lot of the town centers that train structures that produce structures uh, i guess it's kind of like cnc but if there was like one production like for every production queue you had it was like actually doing something on the map so you would actually see a, like a line connecting them or or whatever um and and that would be uh one case of like how the structures work but if you're in a situation where it's like how could I describe this? So the Catithrons were uh, a point of con consternation when they were initially put together for Zabalba because I wanted them to be able to build anywhere they could because they have structure-based construction. And so their town centers were basically going to manifest structures wherever. And I was thinking initially maybe it would increase on like time cost or even resource cost if it was further away from the town center. And that's how I would balance the idea of it uh, taking a long time to... Um, or, or like, you know, you can build proxies super easily with this race if you just have vision. So like, isn't that a, an Imba thing or whatever? And so I was thinking of like, you know, maybe I adjust the cost. Instead, obviously, the, like the, the thing that is now obvious to me about that is we just have a visual cue of like basically this moving unit type entity that moves through the, the world space and arrives at the location and starts starts building it. And that's like an agent of the the town center, basically. But it would be, it would act like almost like a flying unit or something. Um that would probably be how I would Im implement that now. But that, that would be an example of something that's pretty weird and strange. And it's something that you wouldn't see in a conventional game is like, now this town center doesn't train workers. It builds structures and some of those structures train workers or whatever. Uh, that, that would probably be one of the things that will catch people off guard. But again, that's like significantly related to how the, uh, the races thematics are, right? Like that's a reflection of yeah, what the race does. The race is weird. And yeah. Mechanics should also be... Yeah, I mean, you. I you, just can't wait to see Colapazos. <laughs> Dude, I I also can't wait to see Colapazos. They are going to be very I don't know. bizarre. I think I think the thing you said about like, oh, how would I like? As you said, the they would have. I, I'm not entirely familiar with the idea, anyways. But the you said something about like, oh, if it's easily accessible, I would have to like counteract with counteract that strength with some weakness i feel like it's really interesting that like some races identity is like so much different that like there's some asymmetry between like mechanics yes where like uh one race maybe is very economical you can see that with zerg where like oh, yeah. oh you're one expo behind then you're fucked <laughs> like, <basically>. <laughs> if <laughs> so, you have even like, bases have with have an opponent a, player yeah. yeah you're like oh man what the hell so you need to have one more always. So that's really interesting. I find that really, uh, really epic. So, yeah. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff that's like that uh, that can be impa imparted because, like, the reason why Veek brings that example up is obviously the Hatcheros gives you larvae that turns into units as well as workers, like combat units and stuff. And so, like, the more of that you have, the more bases, like, the more bases you have, actually, the more production you have, too. And so these things scale up together, and it actually does mean something very different than oh, I built another command center. Like, well, whoop do you do The Terrans aren't really going to be able to use that super super well unless it's on a base. You know, you, you never build a macro command center, right? So, uh, whereas you might actually build macro yeah. treasuries for the purposes of getting, like, more nuke silos or something or even more quarries. But, like, that's a bit of a separate angle. So, yeah, that's definitely one of those cases. Macro hatches sure. are pretty thematic. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I, more, I, You get more stuff as there. Having you know, more breeding rounds, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's even more um, common in CMBW because of the Kafirlosk and the Gathalosk, the, the morphs of the Macro Hatcherosk or, or of any Hatcherosk, uh, because now you have like these other things that behave differently, that operate differently. And so uh, maybe you don't want your main structures to be those enhanced versions or or maybe you want them to be one, but not the other, obviously, and stuff. So like you have di different play styles will obviously uh, explore themselves in different ways. But like there's all sorts of stuff like that that I think is a big deal. Uh, it's funny because, uh, you know, people ask me about outlandish town centers, which actually isn't that often. It's only Kian who's ever asked that question. But when when that topic comes up, I actually don't think of Zabalba initially. I think of Onitar and I think of the Blood Summon town center because it's just, it, well, it's mostly because of its visuals. Like, I want it to be this, like, enormous portal and... Uh, you know, like just that alone is really thematic. Like, say what you want. Obviously, Warcraft Three is a really ugly game, but I do think that the demon gates that the Burning Legion have had a lot of potential to be more interesting. Unfortunately, they just ended up being these really durable structures that basically spawned these really durable units that did chaos damage, and so everybody's gameplay interaction with them was really toxic and uninteresting. But from a thematic standpoint of like you know demonic invaders, I don't think that the giant portal aesthetic is uh, 
something you should easily dismiss. I think the giant demonic portal yeah. is actually really neat. And, and uh, like, that's just, maybe that's just my own personal, like, I, I like that kind of thing, but that's the, the kind of stuff that I would stress for them. And, um, obviously, I mean, the fact that their workers, uh, the way that their construction is based, I actually imagine like, uh, like you, you mentioned the thematic of the big gate, but I feel like that could even be like, if you had like, a event where like you have that invasion or something you could actually make it so thematic because whatever the demonic race is you could integrate their entire identity just on the arrival of the portal and you could showcase it like if the demons are about like corrupting the essence of the thing maybe it like shatters like terrain and whatever it corrupts like some things around it or whatever you could like showcase so many things with that and could be really like this grandiose event that like introduces mm. you to a race or whatever i think that has a lot of potential actually so. well you you can yeah, also even think about it in the context of like a lot of map makers and blizzard is also guilty of this try to make protoss really technologically imposing in their cutscenes, and this is true in brood war and starcraft 2 like they'll have them warp in when there's nothing to mm. for them to warp in with or whatever or like structures will get started like I distinctly remember some Legacy of the Void cutscene or something where a bunch of Protoss structures just magically started to manifest as if they had been warped in by a scribe or a, a probe rather, but they weren't. They, they just appeared in a cutscene and like they, but they spawned yeah, in the same way. Yeah, they just assumed the CMBW implementation of warping in using Nexus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the the proposal I had a while ago, uh, and it's like. Yeah, they even did it without pylon power. That's right, too. There's an extra layer of that, which is just silly. So it's like they just break all of their gameplay rules for style over substance. And what I would like is, you know, I was thinking that um, something I was th- I've was i been thinking for a while now is like we did this on a technical level. Zerg units actually finish like a second and a half faster than normal so that we can have the birth animation be accounted for in the training time so that at the end of the period that it says they take to train, they are ava- you can immediately use them instead of the train, the morph animation, the birth animation being factored into that or like adding on top of it or whatever, right? And the same is true for Protoss structures in CMBW. The warp flash is no longer something that delays their activation and usage by three seconds. They immediately pop into activation and the warp flash just plays over them afterwards. And that looks much better, by the way. Like if you warp in a photon cannon or as a warden as it's called now, or even a gateway and you immediately start using it and now it actually animates thanks to DF's work instead of lard, which just didn't animate at all. Like you get this visual feedback of the warp flash fading as the structure is operating and that looks really thematic yeah. and interesting. So just that alone is like really nice, even though it's a subtle thing. It's like three seconds of functionality. It's actually really impactful in the middle of the I bio think or the example you gave with them uh, preferring like style over substance is actually uh, like it, it feels like a really good example of like just their laziness because instead of like taking their time to integrate that into the race yeah. and make it interesting, make it a thematic of the race, they just did that for marketing, but not for the actual game. So yeah, it's really, really sad. I would say. Well, it's just like if you were going to, if you're going to show something in an in-game cutscene or whatever, it should just reflect. Like I, I've said this before. There's like an example I have in my head because I. Uh, one of the things that I like to fantasize about is uh, like full, mo- like those really expensive looking uh, cinematics f- uh, that are set in Zabalba or Onatar or whatever. And one of the things I think about all the time is like, I have this scene in my mind where Ansifi are fighting Keltar and then Sykora show up as part of a free for all. And when the Sykora telegraph their presence, like the Ansifi actually change the formation of their units to better suit the threat that they're facing, because that's what you would do in game as an Ansifi captain or, or regent. And you were trying to like order them around. And uh, you, like, that's the idea. Like that's actually reflecting how the gameplay would, would be looking like. It's just like a, it's still a dramatized version, but it's like this thing that you get to experience. And it's not just like, this random shit that happens because, well, we wanted it to happen and it's like vaguely thematic, but it's not at all like how it operates in game. Like, no, it's actually reflective of that because like basically what that tells me when somebody sacrifices the 
integrity of what their game actually is for the sake of like some cheap cutscene or some even like a trailer or a uh like a the cinematic stuff that i was talking about is like if it's not reflective of the game what you're basically saying is we would really like our game to be this epic but it isn't so we had to cheat it's like oh okay so you don't think your right. game is that epic? like surely your game is epic enough for you to just tell an accurate story right like you can embellish it with stat special effects like but... all the devs and all the apologists will just like they will just say something is impossible because they don't want to deal with the second order consequences yeah. and fix them too. <laughs> so instead of like maybe actually like allowing you to warp in stuff outside of power and without using a scribe, a probe in that example, yeah, maybe that would be possible, but it's just like, oh no, that would be overpowered. That would be <laughs> this, that would be that. And it's weird that they say that because StarCraft 2 has warp gate, which essentially does that anyways. Yeah, no, I was using proxy stuff. So. Like you'd think, maybe making the Protoss more Protoss by unifying that mechanic would actually be something they would want to do, but of course, not quite. Not I will really. say too, though, if you want as a design exercise, just take like something that's really epic it, that is only there in a dramatized example, like the opening cutscene for StarCraft One, where there's like a carrier type craft, but it glasses stuff instead of using interceptors. Yeah, just and then just, it just implement it, dude. Just do that. That's what we did with the Star Sovereign. And it's fucking nice. Like it ended up working out really well. I don't think there was any ever a stage where Star Sovereigns were supremely overpowered, at least maybe because of their main gun, but not because of their glassing cannon. Like there's all so much counterplay to that. And you know, it, like, it, but but it's still really quite thematic and epic when it happens. Like, even as the player being glassed, you kind of feel kind of like, oh, man, I got to live out in the movie movement right there. Like, I was on the receiving end of it, but still, it's pretty cool. Like, that's the kind of thing that you can do where if you reflect, like, if you're actually, in this case, we're back engineering it. We're doing the opposite way where we're, here's a trailer and we're going to make the gameplay out of that. But, like, that's still something that you could do as a design exercise that we have done and that we, has generally worked out really well. Like... If we were going to do something like that, that doesn't mean that we're going to go back and add in like, you know, all of the <laughs> like, we're not going to go back in and add the mutalisk beta attack that's in the cutscenes with the carrier because they were just they did the cutscenes out of order and they did it before they finalized the unit stats and stuff, which is funny. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to go in and add that like random Terran missile unit that like launches a, a rocket at a, a wounded dr dragoon in one of the random cutscenes. Like, we're not going to go and do that, but. I mean, I guess we kind of did that with the Wraith cutscene where they shoot a, a spacecraft with a, uh, like they shoot a satellite lasers. with lasers. Like they only have lasers in CMBW. So we kind of did do that, but like, we're not going to go back and do it every single thing, but it's just an interesting design example. You could like take any interesting cutscene or, or cutscene that shows something really avant-garde and, and, and perhaps yeah, quite thematic like and just try to make it work. See if you yeah. can make it work as a, as a designer, right? There are some assumptions that people accept without thinking about them, that some things are not possible. Yeah. And it's just like you do a bit of the work. You you think about it, you try to yeah. uh, make it work, and it just, just works. It's just, it takes a bit of effort to adapt other things of the game, and you probably want to also introduce other epic things, because other ones, it's just like... Your own epic ideas. If you just have ideas, one yeah. epic idea, then it's like sort of silly that other things are so lame. But it's just, it takes... It takes some time, but eventually you get a much better thing. I don't think anyone in the server that actually plays CMBW would want would would, would even try to like argue that <laughs> Brute War was better in in terms of like not having those epic ideas. Right. <laughs> so, you know, clearly like, having uh, a functional ion cannon is better than it just being a static doodad unit, right? Like that's clearly everybody I, thinks. I know that Chandler would probably disagree that it's an epic unit. <laughs> I know it's great. What are you talking about, dude? Didn't you see the the Ion Frills cast? I feel cast like over? the revised. Yeah, I did. Uh, <laughs> I feel like the revised Ion Cannon is not even the like. I don't feel like it's overpowered at all. No, like, yeah, it feels pretty. It's pretty good pretty now. Fun. There's a lot so. of uh, warning. Like I can make the audio visuals better eventually, but like it's it's very it's quite a uh, potent. And when it like sends off the shockwave, letting you know it's gonna hit yeah. pretty soon i like, feel like the thematic. biggest problem right now is that it doesn't leave the visual marker so you might just forget where the thing was actually uh shooting so like it, the marker disappears after it lands uh yeah. after the projectile hits yeah the marker yeah, yeah, yeah. So. 
Well, I could. I guess we could leave a decal or something, like a a real heavy stain from the impact or whatever. That would probably be fine. Uh, It would Um, quickly stack up, but it would probably. I was imagining like you just fire like a marker or something, and it just lands with like a flag or something, maybe some smoke signal. I don't know. I remember you also had some other idea. So that was actually kind of similar to it. Uh, What I had in mind was it would basically be this like. I actually kind of thought about it like a ball that would break apart as it hit the impact. And so it would actually leave a trail pointing in the direction that the projectile is coming from. Like the projectile is going to follow in that same area. It's almost like an arrow that points in the direction the projectile is going to go towards, right? Like, that's the kind of what I thought. That would give you some I remember you also wanted to revise Ion Cannon to have laser, but, laser beam, but it doesn't because of the... Uh, br- br- just brood were not supporting the ring. Yeah, well, laser beam would be nice for sure. Uh, we could also make it work that way. It's just you don't get the same uh, directionality. Even like we could make the laser impact without the beam, but without the beam, you don't get the directionality of it. So, but yeah, like yeah. the ion cannon. If we could get something similar to like those Command and Conquer three cutscenes where they use the ion cannon as a super weapon, um, that would be pretty useful, actually. But imagine how bullshit ion cannon would be if, you would, if we would make it piercing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bye. <laughs> and also go to max. Yeah, range, I was of gonna course. say it has to go to max range then, of course. No. Yeah. Um, well, I guess we've totally. As I usual, guess that could be intercept. That could be cool. <laughs> Uh, the ion whatever. blast going well the, the problem with that is you would just in because its range is so big you would incidentally intercept it without meaning to probably a lot of the time yeah because you'd see the the project the, like the tracker would would be set up letting you know it's coming soon and then you're like oh uh it didn't come i wonder why and then you look to like closer to the front line. i mean that would make the arrow even more sensible though <laughs> although you'd probably need to leave the trail along the entire yeah path. i don't know how you would do yeah. that exactly but it could work. Like you could revise the concept to basically re- release a tracking, like a set of tiny trackers along the way or something, and then th- that would be the trail. But I don't know how exactly that would work out properly. But anyway, that's something we could think about. We've definitely deviated from the t- question at hand, but hopefully it yeah. was good enough for <laughs> Kian. Um, uh, yeah, I-, I think I answered all of the questions that he had about it. Uh, as far as the most outlandish concepts, again, like um, you know. I was talking about Blood Summon's Demon Gate thing. Like, they basically have their workers uh, sacrifice similar to Droleths in CMW or drones in Zerg in general. Uh, however, you can throw multiple of the, you can sacrifice multiple at the same time to speed up the construction. Uh, and so that's also going to be reflected with the visual design of all of their structures. I was actually kind of thinking for a a cute visual tell would be if they have like a lot of skull piles or whatever, something equally uh, grim, what you would probably do is increase those with the amount of sacrifices you made. So if you scout that, you know, oh, he just like, I see fucking five corpses here. Like this guy sacrificed a lot of workers to make that structure. Uh, So that could be kind of neat as like a visual tell uh, to let them know like this guy really spent a lot. He's like all inning me right now, or he's trying to do some timing or something. That could be kind of neat, but uh, that's just a very small visual detail. Yeah. I feel like as a rule of thumb, I would rather have a visual tell for every like kind of state that the game tracks instead of having a lot of hidden state, because uh, it's just something that I'm very wary of where like there is some complexity that you can't account for because it's invisible. (laughs) Well, I in this case, we're talking pretty... about something that isn't really tracked because the structure is already done, but it yeah, just has right. more stuff right. on it, which is like a tell of how it came. It's like an origin tell of anything, but it's still useful information and also thematic, like just to know players will notice those details and, and especially high level players will use them for actual like, oh, scouting response. But uh, generally players will be like, hell yeah, I fucking sacrificed five workers for that one structure. Fuck your skulls, dude. And then like laugh at it or whatever, because they're playing as demons. So they have to be evil, obviously. But uh, yeah, I don't know. That's mm. pretty uh, pretty neat stuff anyway. Uh, we can go on to Miriam's question then. He asks, yeah. how do you plan to implement terrain manipulation in your RTS games? So uh, when I first came up with some of the ideas that I came up with, this kind of dates back to CMBW era stuff with iQuare, rest in peace, homie. He was doing a lot of work with me on Hydra back in the day. That's what CMBW used to be called, Project Hydra. And I came up with the idea of a tactical platform that would land and act as a ramp. So you'd basically be able to build ramps as Terran and just like fly them wherever. 
Uh, and obviously, like, ideally, it would also be bridges. Now, this is something is really good luck ever implementing that in Brood War, dude. Uh, my, my, I tip my hat to you for even trying or even starting to think about the idea. Uh, but as Icor figured out, that's definitely like a new engine territory. So I came up with the idea, but I kind of ended up shelving it. And then when I was coming up with more ideas for stuff like the Ansifi tech tree, I, it came back, the tactical platform came back. The other thing that came back was the concept of uh, what, I, well, one example of this concept is the pavilion where it has the uh, floor plan and the open roof thing, which is basically a transport that you can move around inside and also be attacked inside. Like you're basically, if you have infantry walking around inside this giant armored tank, um, then they can, uh, you know, maybe they benefit from cliff advantage if they're on the upper level or something. And so you'd be able to path around in it, like there'd be a ramp in it or whatever. And then you'd be able to path around inside it while it's moving. And all of a sudden there's really complicated stuff from an engine yeah. perspective. So anyway, I'm, I'm explaining all of this stuff because I know that like, as I'm explaining it, Veek is reminded of how fucking in challenging it would be to implement all this technically. And that's why I just want to clarify, I'm pretty sure Miriam is just asking what we would intend for the the player to experience. But you might also cover some of the things about the technical details here if you want to, like the why it's so co like challenging to do stuff like that for those who are uninitiated. And I don't know if that's worth. Yeah, so that. I'll just quickly mention that basically, if you have a lot of dynamic terrain, it's really hard to optimize pathfinding because you need to do some initial like pass for the pathfinding. So first of all, you have like some more optimized nav mesh. So th if we would update terrain every frame, that means regenerating rating yeah. the nav mesh every frame yeah. and the other thing is uh units also have paths so if you if you change some terrain it might need to invalidate the path so you might just need to have a slowdown because a lot of units suddenly have to find a new path so those are like two main things so that might be problematic we'll see how it goes there might be some like neat little tricks that we can leverage to make it work we'll see yeah so suffice it to say I don't know that it will actually work out in uh, in our first RTS game. That being said, we do have like like terrain editing in the middle of the game, so it must be possible in some level to do that. It might just be a bit jank or slow, so we have to like yeah. see if we can make it optimizable. One of the ideas that I had in Onatar was the Entropic would be characterized by being able to basically move on these imperious platforms that would defy gravity. And they would basically be able to connect, like they would have these mo moving platforms basically that you would be able to stand your units on and they it would travel along a certain area. It wouldn't be the fastest mode of transportation per se, but it could catch opponents off guard and it would also um, yeah, help connect certain areas of entropic themed maps. Speaking of, so. speaking of map editor, imagine if Frog were basically <laughs> a race that has a limited, <laughs> limited access to editor. So you can just like, oh play God. stuff, but it takes yeah. time. And that's funny. Wow, well, that, that is thing. actually you know, I like if we did that, that would be pretty amazing because I mean we do so in in Cosmonarchy Retail, which is where the Thrucker plan to be added. As they're part of a they're one of the Zabalba races. Um, Thruck are basically like planetoids and like their very composite materials. So they are not really like it's hard, it, it's ambiguous as to whether they're sentient or sapient or whatever but they are like animated uh materials that make up like the average planet or what have you so the idea that vika is hitting at here is that they could basically form cliffs and and stuff now in cosmonarchy retail i would really like for all of the races to be able to remove cliffs uh as part of like a very heavy tech up thing, like maybe around tier four or five or something, they can actually come in and just start removing cliffs out of their way so they can dig out new pathways or they can clear clutter from an area to allow heavier units to move through unimpeded, uh, stuff like that. And that would actually be a big part of, for example, the Ansifi War Machine is there would probably be, you know, maps in the Ansifi campaigns, for example, and undoubtedly in multiplayer where they're built around this mechanic because you have this area where infantry can get through just fine, but the, you know, if you want to deploy the pavilion, that big armored tank I was talking about that has like this dynamic pathing and stuff, then that would be a case where uh, you really want to clear out the way first. And so like now that you, you, you start to lay the area bare with your engineers and try to like deconstruct the, the cliffs and stuff. 
for the Thruck, it would also be ideal if they could add new cliffs or add to the area. And we already kind of want, I want the Sykora to basically be able to delete parts of the map. Uh, so that's another like really ambitious thing for their like end game tech or, or late game tech. Um, and by delete, I literally mean just like, er, like it looks like it just vanishes from existence or whatever. So it would be really neat if we yeah, could do something like that. Yeah. Uh, if you were to combine the Sykora and the Thruck in this example, you would basically be able to void out part of the map with the Sykora and then the Thruck could respond by like starting to put it back together <laughs> or build a new part of the map in it or something. So that would be really neat. I don't know exactly how we would fit it into a conventional RTS game flow, but it would be really cool to see because then. Oh, well, I could imagine you just have like some ability, and when you click it, it just shows you the ISOM cursor or something, <laughs> and you just mark some terrain yeah. and you like shift click it or something. So it would be like an order, but it's just uh, and the ISOM brush instead, right? Finally, map editors can play the game too, dude. Map makers can finally be, uh, you know, good at the game. They can just make the map while they're playing. Yeah. You don't like, well, that's kind of one of the interesting things about the customizability though. Warcraft 3 also kind of had this. They just did it in a really lazy way. But the whole idea of like you deforest the trees and you like kill off trees in certain areas to create new paths is actually kind of neat. Uh, it looks really ugly in Warcraft 3. I mean, everything does. It looks very bare bones and not very, you know, detailed or or interesting or dynamic. But it's neat that you get to actually change the terrain a little bit. And so at the very least, having stuff where you can remove those things would be nice. In Onatar, we obviously plan for the voice list. Map, to... uh, this is made out of mineral fields. <laughs> that yeah. Also the... yeah, Crystallis or whatever it's called. Um, <sighs> Mineralis really is what it should be called. In fact, the remake for of Crystalis in CMW should obviously be called Mineralis, and I'm surprised nobody's done didn't, it. Didn't didn't uh, PTB make that? I think I so. Think he, did. he probably did that fucker. Well, yeah. So anyway, I do want terrain manipulation to be epic, um, and I do want it to be in the games. A lot of it is down to how responsive we can make the pathing, and so it may not show up in our uh, first RTS, but it's a very heavy planned feature of um onatar and of course of, of cosmonic retail especially not just the terrain manipulation but the dynamic terrain part where you see like the open floor and floor i mean the open roof and the floor plan stuff that i was talking about where you have units moving around inside other units basically so that is very complicated stuff to do and that's definitely stuff where we need our own engine for because good luck trying to implement that in anything but those are some of like the more ambitious plans that we have for later and uh, we're still evalu evaluating whether or not we can fit it into our first game yeah. And there you go. Those were the coffee questions. Again, thanks for the homies for supporting us. Uh, I guess we could ask uh, if there's been progress. We can sort of go over progress. Yeah, so let's first. recap the progress and indicator and the yeah. demo. I will first say the, all the engine stuff. Sure. So basically, the just the thing of what is done is basically some technical backend stuff where I have revised a bit how memory arenas work. I have added uh, thread contacts for scratch arenas. I have uh, added some interesting, very useful, and very productivity improving uh, linked list macros. And uh, oh, I also made uh, an actual isometric support for the front end of the editor. Backend is still tile based, which will be revised at some point. Uh, and this basically makes editor uh, functionality sort of comparable to how Isenbrush works in a CM draft. There are a few caveats that will be resolved by re implementing the backend. And yeah, that, that's that's basically it for the in terms of editor. And another two revisions that I have is that I'm planning on doing is one is for UI, uh, sort of like improving the layouting. That's something I read about in Ryan Fleury Substack a lot. Uh, gave me some interesting ideas that I will probably try at some point. Uh, that should allow us to improve. Uh, editory UI and stuff, uh, nice. other stuff like that, and then also do some more. Uh, like currently, the the way I do UI is a bit bothersome and it's a bit ugly and not very robust, and I just had a lot of friction when adding new UI. So yeah, that's something that I will revise, and it should allow us some great things. Another thing I'm working on. Uh, is obviously AI. I have uh, planned some. I have drafted some initial 
like structural ideas about how it yeah. may function with like armies and uh, build sequences. And I keep uh, keep thinking about that, how to make that work for what we need. And I feel like that uh, structure seems to be flexible enough for us to implement stuff like. Uh, them actually managing armies, uh, probably to have some better kiting, to actually like define a bit of the identity of the AI, and also to allow dynamic stuff like maybe containing or whatever. So, I think that has potential. So I will keep keep working on that. And yeah, I think that's most of the update here. I look forward to being contained by an AI. That'll be the first time it's ever happened to me. I know Mesk was working on a StarCraft II prototype a while back when he was still working within that uh, unfortunate game. And he was talking about how uh, he had a map, his tutorial map, a bunker rushed players to make it so that if they weren't serious about playing the game, they just immediately got butthurt and left, basically, was his yeah, idea. Yeah, that's technically yeah. possible in CMBW. I even did it at Farm Upgrap once or twice. A while ago, yeah, you... Uh... It's something that you... And it requires for you to, like, pre-place, prefix uh, some positions on the map, and yeah. it's really rigid so we need some dynamic solution for that basically yeah the biggest problem is definitely the decision making of the ai in the cmbw example because you can make it yeah. so that it kind of does things intelligently but it's really kind of it's really conditional and really fragile as well like you know if you just kill the worker it deinits the whole like forward town and stuff right and there's like stuff like that that's a big problem for sure Although I think maybe we were able to fix like safeguard against that specific case, but there's like stuff like that, that can really slow things down. They, um, you can't, it's not like I, I tried it's, it's maybe not super useful on the programming end of the implementation, but I, as far as the AI is concerned, like if you think, if your goal is to proxy somebody or to contain somebody or whatever, you are going to sort of unify a lot of your actions towards that goal. And CMBW AI does not unify any of its actions, really. It's like, it's okay, I'll throw some of my goal. stuff in that area, and then I'll throw some of my stuff in this area. And it's like I'm trying yeah. to do maybe a bun maybe three or four different tasks, and I'm not unified at all in that. And if it works, it's like, well, I guess it worked. And then if it doesn't work, it's like, I'm fucked. So... You know, it's just totally ineffective, yeah. ineffectual. That's why I hope happening. the build sequence system in Antikatera might help with that. Because basically, I don't know, I don't think I explained that before, because I think this is the first time I'm talking about yeah, this. But is, yeah. basically, the way build sequences would work is they would sequence some, like, orders, and you'd have three condition blocks, as far as I remember. The first one is the activation of the block, so when the AI should actually activate it. Uh, the second one was like uh, an exit uh, from the mode, so basically from the sequence, so basically on what condition should they interrupt. And then I think the third one was for temporary pausing, so pa pause until those conditions are no longer true. Uh, I think yeah. those were my three blocks, but yeah, I'm keeping... Uh, I keep interacting on it, so I might might or may not be the way. Uh, finally, yeah, yeah, because we'll see. so you would you would want to just pause it if like one unit sneaks into your base and starts attacking you. But if it's like a huge army, you might just need to abandon it and, and like go to the next thing and and yeah. defend, right? So there'd and be if like you different like, things that you, if would you have like a build and... sequence that focuses on like spamming Zephyr cores, uh, in terms of and like the example of CMBW, yeah, sure. and then you see that like 70% of the enemy army is air, then you <laughs> just want to interrupt. Right. You would you would just completely abandon it, uh, most likely. Or I guess maybe you would have a, a tweak condition instead of a pause. In this case, it would be like drop down to 50, but maybe that's better conceptualized as like a completely different build sequence, right? It's like... Yeah, I'm not sure, because there are a lot of like dynamic stuff that you would want, yeah. because maybe you would want them to... Instead, go to quasis if they already made a spawning pool, whatever. So maybe I need to revise this as like a decision tree based system or something. <laughs> I I'm, I'm not sure. There's a lot of like complicated stuff that needs to happen. That I just haven't worked with this model before. That's why it takes me so long to make AI. Because if I were to just re-implement what Brute World did, that would be easy. It would take me like two days at most. But mm. it's I'm trying to find a solution that works for a way. 
uh, yes, more dynamic yeah. thing. And, Absolutely. Well, yeah. even if we and don't have support for every single thing we might want to put in the build sequence, like even if we don't initially have contained support or logic for that or whatever, like just having the framework for that, even if it takes longer to initially implement and we only initially end up using it for something similar to this, the default brood war shit or whatever, like that's still going to be better long. Yeah, that's right? definitely so. useful feedback. It might just be that we need to scrap it and start over, but I, I should definitely implement it. It's just taking me a, a while now. And yeah, it's, uh, like, my initial issue probably is that you probably would want armies and build sequences to be able to, like, interact with each other. Because if... Uh, basically, the army part is... The army concept is, like, sort of similar to build sequence, but it defines a composition in terms of, like, fractions and stuff. So that part is, like, you kind of would need to integrate them to work between each other. So I'm not yet sure how that's going to work. So, yeah, it's just I need to uh, either prototype it or try to uh, make it work conceptually. We'll, we'll see. I think, uh, yeah. yeah. So what what is the, the demo progress then? Is that so, something you... Yeah, the I've been working on the first two missions of the demo. Uh, we plan to have four missions and then a couple of skirmish options and stuff. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to also maybe have with the demo is some sort of co-op map or something like that, but I'm uh, not sure we won't just uh, fall back on like 2v2 skirmish maps. And obviously, we don't know if the people at IndieFund are even going to bother playing it in multiplayer or not. But, uh, you know, figure might as well show off, hey, we got netcode it, so isn't that epic? So, like, maybe that's yeah, that's is. pretty much the only reason why we would want it to show that. But I'd really want to actually finish my UI layout stuff so we can actually have a main menu. Sure. And yeah. I also sort of have to like figure out how to do lobbies networking wise because that's also something I have no idea about. Yeah, that's fine. We can do exploration stuff on that for sure. I think the the biggest imp like the reason why we would want all of these features is basically to put our best foot forward saying like we made this engine ourselves. Like obviously Veek did the 99.999% of the work or whatever. But like, like the point is like we are responsible for making our own engine for our own games. So here's like, you know, here's a demonstration of what is, what all is possible. Like we got this level of performance out and that's still like, you know, here's the spots that still need work or whatever, giving them a, a complete picture and showing them like, even if you don't play co-op, just know that multiplayer does work. Like it is functional. And so like knowing that that part is taken care of or being able to have some kind of, um, uh, some idea that that is the case is going to be, it's going to go a long way, I think for, uh, communicating to them that we're serious about what we're doing. Right. Cause like, I'm sure a lot of people have said, I'm going to make my own engine guess, and then didn't do it. Right. I guess a thing that would be neat to have, but I haven't actually considered it yet. But it would be neat to be integrated with Steam already and just be able to invite people using Steam. That would be great. Oh, invi would... invite... Well, not only for the, the multiplayer stuff, but also if we're going to have the demo. Yeah, I for the demo specifically. I, I think know. it would be neat because... Well, we have, I would... I'm sure we can find a way to to do this relatively easily, but uh, you'll have to pay the $100 for Steam Direct. But beyond yeah. that, it's... um, I don't know if it's possible to have a private product page i assume it is and that way we wouldn't have to publicate anything about the demo like you would just you it's not like we'd be releasing the demo for anybody we would still be able yeah. to invite them specifically right to give them a product key for that and then we wouldn't have it on the like you can't search it on steam to find it that that would be important to make sure that like everything is like we we can consider opening it up publicly uh to give people an idea of what we're doing uh, afterwards if we feel really strongly about the work like one of the things we've gone back and forth with about is like say we don't get the funding from indie fund like if that happens and we're not planning for that to happen because we we feel pretty confident in the work that we're doing and the direction we're going for the genre and for our own work but if that does happen let's say they're like oh rts is a dead genre lol okay bye and then like okay well if that's going to happen we probably do you know go much more public with the development and uh you know maybe we do put the demo out there for everybody to see and then like try to build some interest and in, and hype around it and then just progress on it without that that cash flow. But obviously the cash flow would be pretty fucking nice. So we'll have to see uh, yeah. how it plays out. We'll, we'll we'll get there eventually. One way or the other is the bottom line. <laughs> is it everything you wanted to mention about the demo? The demo has been yeah. So the the two maps that we have for the demo. The first one is uh, what I I just actually kind of described this a little bit in the big boys table as well. It's like the first uh, map is, uh, it's still pretty different. 
But the environment, at the very least initially, is going to seem kind of normal familiar. for the most part, kind of familiar. And then as you yeah. eventually progress to the opponent's base, because of course this is an RTS campaign, so your objective is to destroy the enemy base. Uh, when you get to your enemy's base, you'll see that they are built around something that is very much not normal as a terrain feature. It's not something you've ever seen before in an RTS game, I can tell you that much. And as a result of that, it, you so first of all, the whole setting, and this is something that I don't even think I shared with Veek before, so uh, he may have read this in the chat, because in our uh, donor chat, our, our Chad supporter chat, we... Uh, I know. What you're... Yeah, we, we talked a little bit about this. Um, Miriam was asking if there was going to be space travel or something in the, in the setting. Uh, the entire world, the setting of this game is basically a galaxy wide, a galaxy sized, uh, planet, planetary body. Yeah. So, so you might, you might, dis you, you, you might dare flood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty much. Well, it's not, it's like within this enormous, <laughs> within this enormous planetary body, there are still like things like moons. It's just that instead of empty yeah. space, you just have like a sky and an atmosphere and whatever. And so there's all these different things, right? And so that that gives you options to have really wacky settings and, and setups and stuff uh, for the environment. And so this thing is kind of like a mountain, this, this thing that I'm referring to that the enemy base is built around, but it's not a mountain, but it's very tall. And to show off the fact that our editor allows you to stack infinite levels of height, uh, <laughs> we are basically having you climb to the very top of this. And uh, that's the second mission, basically, is you start off at the base of it, and then you can very quickly climb up it, and your opponent is also on the base of it in a different spot, like they've fallen back to another position, and uh, your objective is to basically reach the, the summit uh, and take control of it, and then also destroy your opponent, and that's so that you can get to what is connected to that summit, and I'll leave it there for now. Uh, th that's uh, all the details I'll share for now, but it's very exciting to see that. I've already started the layout, uh, like the layout for the first mission is pretty much done. The layout for the second mission is maybe about halfway done, but it's really cool to see the shaping that has been done with the layers of stacked cliff. Like that part is really neat and it's something that I've always wanted in Brood War. So finding it in Antikythera, yeah. you know, is really epic, really interesting. So. so yeah, that's what I'll say about the demo there. There's the, so a little bit more details, a little bit more progress. I'm sure people will be uh, appreciative of the, the info. Yeah. Oh. With demo, demo stuff covered, I want to ask you the final question. Yeah. And it is, what game design lessons have you learned or intuited from your time spent in CSGO as interviewer, caster, podcaster, and whatever else? So uh, this actually you know put Counter-Strike back on the brain. And so that's probably one of the main reasons I kept referencing it in the middle of the previous conversations. But it's funny because obviously I was making analogs and, uh, you know, comparisons yeah. and stuff in terms of game uh, design and uh, player psychology and whatnot. So it's definitely been, it's definitely the most I've followed professional com like gaming, competitive gaming um, since like the, the heyday of brood war back, way back. So it's the thing I'm most immediately familiar with, with like, I know a lot about the top teams and I know even a lot about the contender teams and stuff. And it's, basically like because i also come at the perspective I, I come at csgo from the perspective of a game designer and a level designer i can critique a lot of the maps i can critique a lot of the design decisions i can critique the game state i can critique the economy uh but i can also see just like in brood war how the professionals adapt to that environment and how as long as there's a core thing about your game that's compelling you can have so many shortcomings that don't get really heavily uh, critiqued or even uh, examined or thought of. Like, you know, a lot of things about the game's economy, people have just kind of given up on even trying to manage that properly. And they just like, yeah, this is just the paradigm we're in. And so uh, basically you can be like kind of the, the low effort parent that Valve has been to their product uh, of Counter-Strike. And as long as you don't fuck with the what is really important about the core part yeah, of the game. Yeah, does that ring familiar with Brood War? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. As long as you don't mess it up, like, too much anyway. Like, I definitely think a lot of their changes have just been net negatives. Like, they made a nerf to the op where you moved slower yeah. while scoped in. And that was back in 2015, I think. And it's, I just feel like it lowered the skill ceiling of the game, but for no real reason. 
Um, it, there was no trade-off. It's not like the app got stronger in some way. It's just now you can't do more flashy mechanical things with it because you'll get shot by because you move slower. So that feels really lame. Uh, and if you can go back to the, like and undo that nerf, I think the game would be better. Uh, a lot of people disagree with that because they think ops are overpowered. But I actually want tools to be powerful, and so especially since there is counterplay. Like you can use flashes, you can use you know off angles and positioning, and uh, you can use the fact that they're fucking scoped in so they can't see their whole screen. <laughs> so there's like a lot of things you can use to counteract that. And I think pros would adapt just like they've adapted. Maybe, to maybe else. map design doesn't necessarily expose that because yeah. you don't in most. At least from my memory, I might be wrong. I don't follow it as much as you. But most maps don't have as many like off angle like entrances to to them. You usually have like like in Dust Two, for example, you like on A there's long and yeah. on B they can either come from mid or from the tunnel. So it's like it's with the up up example, it's pretty easy to just like line up a shot, and it's like not that easy to. Uh, like backed or someone or whatever. So. Yeah, the the 2015 op nerf was more like if you were Kenny S or one of these other really good op players at the pro level, like JW as well was another example of this. You could scope in and then peek somebody instead of being passive. And the reason why ops are always passive now is be, is primarily because of this op nerf. Maybe it still mm. would have become that anyway because of the way that utility leveled up over throughout the game, but it would have been for a fairer reason than now you just can't do this thing that you used to be able to do. I feel the same way about bunny hopping and general movement. They nerfed a lot of that in Counter Strike's uh, global offensive compared to yeah. the. There's, games. There are actually a few questions I would want to ask you about mechanics, but I would first want you to uh, finish your. Yeah, yeah. I would just say, like, the predominant thing that I come away with CSGO from, at least in the current phase, is. Even though the game is in a really bad spot right now compared to some of the great greatest eras of its gameplay, uh, even though the economy is in a bad spot, even though everybody's saving all the time because of that economy being in the bad spot, and so it, you know games are less fun to watch, and even though games go super long and now you can't even hold your attention to one game for long because it's just always 30 rounds, always overtimes, whatever. Um, even though all that is true, and even though a lot of the maps are bad, you still have a good like core game to operate around with the way that the shooting mechanics work. Uh, and this is despite all of the other issues with the shooting mechanics, by the way, like RNG and, and this other shit. Um, but mm. you go through all of the flaws and it still doesn't stop the game from being quite compelling and satisfying in, in many ways that have endured for a very long time. And that to me th tells me that while the game, yes, could be so much better if valve, you know, put the effort in and made the right decisions, you really only need to get a couple of right decisions right. Like you really only need to do a couple of things absolutely right. And then the rest is all gravy in, in that respect. So like it's, it's, like it's the most successful the game. It's the most successful it's ever been at CSGO, right? Like mm -hmm. it right now in terms of player count. And that kind of tells you that even though I'm a bit of a hater, it doesn't really matter because everybody just wants to play. So they're doing something right in that respect, even though they're not really doing much of anything at all. Um, I can say yeah. I could ask you about your thoughts on CS2, but I, I think I will ask you the dungeon another uh, another time. Oh, it's pretty much the same game. The movement is different. The smokes are different. The game looks much worse, and that's pretty much it. So yeah, what what is different about movement? I, uh, because of their sub tick know. system, the base tick rate is sixty four. I think. Um, when it's not doing the sub tick thing. And so movement actually feels, hey, pros have said it feels worse. It just feels different. I don't actually know if it's good or bad. I haven't played with it myself. Um, uh, do people play on 128 on uh, LANs and stuff? Yeah, yeah, and Face It has 128 tick uh, mm -hmm. servers. Uh, mm -hmm. Only matchmaking servers are 64 tick. But the base tick rate is not 128 tick. They just, shooting feels way more consistent and grenade throws are way more consistent. But uh, like shooting feels like yeah. 128 tick and grenades feel like 128 tick or whatever. So that's fine. But the movement itself was a bit of a casualty and I don't know if they're going to be able to fix it or not. So that's like, yeah, hopefully they just up it to 128, I guess. Yeah. Hope, I'm not even maybe, sure if that fixes the problem. Possible. That's just what people are speculating. Cause of course Valve doesn't release info about this stuff. So uh. yeah. But, well, maybe it's at least adjustable for launch. Yeah, 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 it should definitely be possible to raise the base. Well, anyways, the, the questions I had for uh, what do you feel about some mechanics? So first, maybe I will sh tell you uh, a thing I was thinking. 
I is that, I'm sort of trying to learn CS a bit on like the mechanical level. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what are your thoughts about like uh for example like movement acceleration because it's it's sort of funny that uh as a player, you actually don't want it at all. So people just counter strafe. Mm -hmm. And I was curious, what are your like design thoughts on how that like works? Well, I've thought about the jiggle peak before, which is where you like only giving a bit of a shoulder, and so that you're trying to bait on an op shot yeah. or some sort of like info to, for wherever the enemy is, so that you can then peek them wider. And I think that kind of looks really stupid, <laughs> but. Right. At the same time, it is a mechanically demanding task, and it's also based on decision making and all this other stuff and intuition. So it's at least testing interesting skills, even though it looks a bit silly. Like the silly look test doesn't always mean that you have to completely change things. But like in the case of Dark Souls, where like a full plate or knight is like rolling around instead of taking hits, it's that's pretty <laughs> stupid, right? So like just yeah. just visually, it looks dumb, and you don't really want to corrupt the essence of that. But well, the, if it's the, just visual, anyways. Then why would you? Yeah. The the jiggle peak is like, okay, whatever, that's just a little bit of a weird thing, but uh, you can play that up. Like, the casters are actually really good at taking stuff that would probably look just retarded and uh, to the average person and then, like, making it kind of interesting or hype. And that's like, like there's a clip where um, mm. Brokey from FaZe Clan is, is clutching against Astralis and, like, I think it was a one-on-four or some may have been even a one-on-five. Uh, and he, he jumps to the lower side of Nuke, plants the bomb after getting a couple of kills, and... Uh, then Glaive, the IGL of Astralis, is, is trying to open the door into the bomb site, and Brokey just keeps slamming it shut after. <laughs> He's, and it's like it's like the stupidest fucking mechanic. But like they just keep hitting the door back and forth. But like Anders is able to cast it in a way that's actually entertaining. Uh and yeah. so it's not like like that's a moment that actually like we're really spoiled for the casting talent that we have at the top tier, where they can do a lot of really good stuff. Like they can they can carry all the imagine if they had uh good. Like CMBW kind uh, epic moment instead of <laughs> this is silliness. Yes, yeah, pretty much. Be, like really the epic moments in Counter Strike uh, can be like you know really well put together utility takes that like flash everybody, burn everybody out. That's like a tactical man's wet dream or whatever. And then you get the like obviously the mechanical stuff that's super amazing, incredible, uh, superlative, where they just absolutely you know, dome everybody with one hit or like, you know, there's a clip earlier to just today of, uh, in I am Rio, uh, Zywu gets a three K with a Deagle out of nowhere on the lower side of nuke. And it's like, how the fuck did he do that? Like, that's crazy stuff. So like stuff like that can happen all the time. And that's the kind of thing that where individual excellence can tip the balance. And that's like one of the things that's really cool about the game. So again, I'm trying mm. to remember the specifics of your, your question. You were just asking me about the Eric, the, the movement acceleration. I think, a lot of the times, like the jank mechanics or whatever, like it used to be better. Again, it used to, used to be able to be hop and used to be able to use this acceleration stuff to your advantage a lot more. Uh, and then they, they restricted a lot of the movement. So it matters much less in the average game where like, I actually want people's movement skills to be tested. I'm not really yeah. good at movement at all. So I like, I can't hit all those trick shots out of Mirage window or whatever, but I still really like when I see a player do it. And it, it uh, unfortunately there's an extra layer to this that you have to keep in mind as a game designer it's the same thing that happens in like brood war where things just happen in brood war pro matches and artosis or whoever is casting is not going to cover all of the minutia because they're busy talking about the high level strategy but it's not that easy guys like these people have to take every yeah. worker and put them on the mineral line and they have to fix every bad path and they have to do like they have to move all of their units out of the way to build one structure and they have to do all this stuff like they're doing all of these things just for the purpose of like, you know, basically baseline functionality in most people's minds. Yeah, it all looks true. automatic. Like, into, yeah. into your way, right? Yeah, it, it looks automatic, but it's not. And you're, that's invisible actions, basically, invisible skill. It's skill that is really impactful, obviously, because without it, you literally can't operate in the game. But it's invisible in the sense I that the average like viewer the... isn't going to see it. The same thing is actually true for sprays and for movement in CS where like yeah, they, yeah. you see them hit a, a jump and the average player might, or average spectator, especially if they don't play the game, might be like, oh, they just, yeah, they, you can just jump there. I feel like game timer is also like invisible skill because if you look at a pro match, everything just happens on timing yeah. and uh, is way faster because they know what they're doing. And yeah, like yeah. the lower skill level you go, the, the longer it takes for things to happen. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. yeah. You, well, or, or it's too telegraphed in some way. Like they they right. run too soon, so they give up that they're rushing like with enough time for you to get an, into a bit a better spot or whatever. Like that happens no. all the time at the lower level as well. Yeah, and uh, and like that no. kind of stuff is good in some ways because it means that if you are on the come up and you haven't learned that skill, then you as the lower skill team or the lower tier team might get absolutely, you know, exploited by a higher tier team that has all of this stuff. And that can be a teachable moment for like the spectators, but the casters can talk about the fact that like these guys aren't using this element of the game to the fullest potential. And this is an area where this like more experienced team really shines or something. So that kind of stuff can be done, but it requires extra legwork from the the people. It, it's not the explosive, mechanical, visceral play that you see when somebody just hits a lot of nutty shots out of nowhere. And that's the kind mm. of stuff that's like the really great moments that we all remember from CS matches or even the stuff that's like throwing nades, even though there's like complicated lineups involved, you can still at least understand, Hey, they're throwing, you know, utility. And if you've seen it enough times, you kind of know where it's going to go anyway. And like, yeah. it, you can kind of like put that together, but like the degree to which it's impressive when somebody hits a crazy spray transfer and kills like three people in one spray, it is so difficult to explain exactly how, dif how impossible that task actually is because the average yeah. player cannot control their spray that way. So when it happens, I mean, there's the in uh, tough question that nobody wants to ask, which is how much of that was luck due to RNG. But then there's also the question of, okay, well, like that was actually really good spray control. So it looks really epic. But maybe to the average person, they just think, yeah, he put his crosshair on his head. Like uh, Thorin described it in a funny way that I'll steal for this when um, I think it was on the show that I did with him when I interviewed him on this channel, actually. And I was asking him about like spray patterns and stuff. And he basically said, like, you're programming an algorithm into your brain that tracks the movement of the uh, to correct the, uh, the displacement or whatever of the gun. And it's like you that's invisible. That's just totally invisible to the average player. And so uh, the recoil control and stuff. It, it is yeah, a skill, the, but it's really hard to the, track. So Some of the lag you could uh, think of is, like, definitely RNG, but also you might just happen to, like, guess what the yep. thing was yeah, without yeah. really knowing. Absolutely. Right? So. Well, CS2 yeah. kind of changes that because they have a follow recoil command, which I think is going to be enabled for, like, every pro is going to switch to that eventually. Like, they'll figure out that it's way better. Because after the first 10 bullets, where which is where you're probably pretty good at remembering the spray yeah, control I as a pro, it. you will just immediately, like, you'll still be able to track it after those 10 bullets. So I think spraying will actually be way more approachable in CS2. Uh, that's actually something that that's probably, like, maybe when I have more time with it or something, I can talk a bit more in depth about that or whatever, if it's even relevant to something that's related to the show. But I can probably talk a little bit more in depth when I have more experience with it. But I feel like CS2 is generally going to be a lot more approachable for some of the more complicated things that... Right, up until this yeah. point probably were a little bit too stupid like the thing i thought about spray and see there's actually like a command but it's uh, like server sided so you can't yeah. change it it's cheaper how much the crosshair well. actually follows uh the the knockup of the spray so yeah. you, if you set it to one you you actually you actually can read what the spray is. Yes. And in normal CS, that's not possible, which is a bit weird. Uh, I know what the setting does. I saw how it works. Uh, it's basically, it does like buff, where like 50% of the spray is reflected on your cursor position. And 50% is just like visual displacement of the crosshair on the screen, which I found a bit weird, but... Well, I, I guess when people get used to it, they were saying that it's significantly better and it just makes I spraying see. super yeah, easy. Yeah, so. right. Yeah. It's, it definitely uh, is an yeah. adaptation. Like, that's why I said pros are going to have to switch over maybe somewhat gradually. But... I, I was thinking that it would be the best if the spray, just, like, if your crosshair just followed the, yeah. uh, the spray. But it might be more shaky, so that might be a problem. Uh, anyways, uh, coming back to the acceleration question, I, I, I was curious if you would think uh, that reducing uh, how like slow the acceleration is or removing it would be a positive impact for the game. So reducing how slow it is, what is that? What is yeah, that so speeding, speeding up the acceleration. Okay, like, so, you, so you making it, it so that you reach your top speed much faster, would that be better for the game? I think and you after, have faster. Yeah, I think after people, I mean, it would make it easier to do the eighty eighty counter strafing, um, because you'd still be inaccurate while moving, presumably, so that wouldn't change. Yeah. So, I'm trying to think about if that would be an improvement. After people adapt to it, it probably makes movements more predictable. 
but it also maybe not because you can also change direction faster. So by ADADing, you can go back and forth left and right, but you can also just like turn around and leave a bit faster from being stationary or from some other position. So it might, I, I feel like maybe it wouldn't make a huge impact at the end of the day, but it might be better for feeling because you don't have that sl little bit of a sluggish nature to your movement where there's a bit of a drifting right. almost um, when you yeah. uh, release a movement key. And th that's obviously counteracted with the counter strafing uh, since you can be almost perfectly accurate at when you hit the A key while hit, while you were previously holding D or whatever. Like there's a moment where you can just get a one bullet headshot unless RNG fucks you, of course, which is hilarious. But <laughs> like, yeah. that's just something that's in the game that's been in the game for a long time. Um, would it be an improvement? It might just make things more consistent. Uh, and maybe it would also mean that Basically, what 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 I imagine you're saying is, if you release D, it's closer to hitting A than before this change. Like, if you make this change, releasing mm. D kind of does the same thing as hitting A. It, 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 obviously, hitting A would still be there as a mechanic. Yeah, it's like you wouldn't would... need to counter save as much, I guess. Yeah, because you'd be halting faster. That would probably be good for initial swings, but you would still counter strafe to offset your opponent's accuracy or whatever in the middle of gunfights. So I still think I it would probably be fine. Like it, it would maybe make the first shot more powerful for the attacking side, but that's, I think that's probably the, I guess for those who don't know, uh, I mean, the reason I'm asking those questions is out of curiosity, but the other reason really that I didn't really, uh, think about is that we, we are actually making an FPS game at some point. So. Yeah. Uh, it's useful to think about those things, I think. And yeah, yeah. well, in in our FPS game in Heaven Sent, uh, the I, it's set in the Zabalba universe, and the idea is going to be that there's like much more verticality to the battlegrounds. There's going to be certain. I don't. I don't know about like if we're going to do classes or anything like that, but I know we're going to have crazy equipment. I know some of that will be utility based, and I know that there's definitely going to be an emphasis on you know platforming or whatever uh, as part of your approaches to things. And that's going to obviously be reflected in the level design. What would it be well. like? Uh, verticality. Uh, our interesting like merge of CS:GO and like I don't know, Halo, not Halo, it's something else. Uh, it's you're probably thinking Quake. Titanfall or oh, Quake, yeah. Uh, I think I always really liked the idea of a game sort of like the Star Wars Battlefront games, but actually good, where you have this broad scale conflict happening, where there's like a series of objectives. And they're kind of like, you know, I don't know. That's probably closer to what I would. I don't know if I would want to do a Counter-Strike style game of attack shooter that's like round based or whatever. I mean, maybe there would still be rounds in Heaven Sent, but I kind of think about it like I think it would be really cool to have this whole system where you can basically do like. Uh, if you secure this facility that starts out as neutral, you can deploy vehicles or something or better vehicles maybe or something like that. Right. Uh, and then like you get better equipment and stuff. And then also the idea that if you, you know, when you die, eventually you um, spawn in as a different uh, entity or whatever, but like the available entities that you can spawn in as that would all be like derivative uh, downstream of the um, RTS, you know, units or whatever, right? Because it's the same setting. That stuff would be like, well, my fa my team has secured like a, a advanced facility of some kind, and so now I can spawn in as a higher tier unit. Almost, you could kind of think about it like that. That was kind of the the pitch that I was having to myself. Uh, but again, not not a whole lot is formalized. I know I wanted to right. stress mobility, which is where Quake comparisons would definitely come in, or Titanfall, or whatever. I haven't actually played Titanfall, so I probably shouldn't say that it's like that because I don't really know what it's like, but I know that it involves like wall running and stuff. So like, I think that it's, stuff could be really I cool. I think from what I know is like sort of like Apex. Uh, yeah, that's the Apex is you know in Apex? the Titanfall setting. So the same, right. same game, which is pretty funny or same uh, world. But like, that's the kind of thing that's like, I know that Apex has a grappling hook, I believe. And you can like sort of use that to platform around and, or whatever. Um, maybe I'm thinking of, I know I've seen people do what looks like using a grappling hook, but that might be them using like a a rope that there like a zip line. A zip line. Right yeah, now. yeah, that's what it is. So there it is. Uh, yeah, I think when I think about it in general, I just think about it like 
I would like something that is an FPS with scale and with uh, like a lot scale of things expression. happening, right? So yeah, and, and scale expression. Like part of it would be like delivering the fantasy of being on the front line in one of these big battles that happens in Zabalba, and that necessitates there to be scale. Uh, but also, like I don't know, that probably wouldn't be the formula for making a really like high population like high player base game that's like super su financially successful or whatever because people mm. like their tech games like they like call of duty and they like counter-strike and stuff i don't think that's really going to influence our design decisions necessarily but it would be nice if we were able to build something that we had like we ourselves enjoyed as long as that's the case then there's going to be a group of people who follow us down that rabbit hole anyway so um but yeah, yeah i think the movement side of things would definitely be more responsive than CS. It would be in the mobility in general would be probably a bit closer to quake. Maybe not as much as like all of the jumping that they do. Cause I also think that's a little silly, but, um, if you just move faster, like if you just move closer to like the old doom or whatever, like that's probably better as the baseline. And then vehicles, and funnily enough, wouldn't have movement inaccuracy. Um, yeah, I don't think it's, I haven't thought about it too deeply because it's never something that always, that was super like exciting to me. But right. if we have higher time to kill than CS, then we don't need to have movement and accuracy because you can actually right. shoot while yeah. moving and that's fine. Um, and then you can like duck behind cover in the middle of fights or whatever. And then that's also fine. Whereas you can't really do that in CS, like the time to kill is super low. And that's cool because like it's a different kind of game and, and that's like part of the charm that you can just instantly execute people um, depending on your weapon and depending on your position and stuff. Uh, but the angle for Heaven Sent would probably be more like it takes longer to kill enemies probably closer to like halo levels or whatever not certainly not as high as like overwatch obviously like that game takes forever to kill people and sometimes if they're a tank and then like it's very context sensitive so like the circumstance of the battle like if we go all the way back to the beginning of the show the circumstances are like i start this by getting the jump on you so i get a bit of an early advantage because i i can like hit you with my first attack before you can respond and then then you start to respond and like it's maybe you can outskill me or maybe you can hide and, and maybe i just finished the job and so either way it's like that's that can be more interesting anyway. And that can lead to more compelling battles that, right. you know, take a while to, to finish and take a while to resolve. But, um, also the fact that your baseline more mobile, um, I, I think that's actually a really neat dynamic because most of the time you think about vehicles and they give you more speed in heaven sent, they would actually give you less speed, but they would be like more powerful. Right. So there'd be concentrated power. Uh, in some way, shape, or form. Maybe they'd be utilitarian. Maybe they would be something else. But that would be my idea anyway, is like you already move pretty fast, so you don't actually need the vehicles for mobility. Uh, you might want an aircraft or something, a spacecraft in the future. Uh, like super, Maybe that would be like a super late game thing that you could get. Uh, and that would allow you to like navigate the battlefield more freely on the Z axis. Uh, but, mm. you know, irrespective of platforming, uh, basically, you would, you would r break the tether for that. And then you could sort of like move around the battlefield and see if you can maybe do a surgical strike. But obviously, you, you're very obvious because there's not really that much shit in the sky. So like you can kind of see that like, oh, he's coming in with an air, uh, air unit or whatever. So that can be really interesting, I think. And then you get into this whole like interesting push and pull where they've got a vehicle deployed here. So it's like a point of interest that we can focus our attention on and maybe neutralize it before it does too much damage. But it still represents a really powerful like option and opportunity for the player who has the team who has the vehicle right and so that's the kind of thing that i would probably go for for if somebody sat me down and gave me all the budget and told me to make the game now I, that's probably what i would do right is like this mm. um series of events where like one player's maybe one team is on the defense in most of the cases and they have to defend a, a point or maybe it's just like a tug of war kind of thing where they they fight over neutral points initially and then the more they claim the better they are or whatever and they, then you have to figure out how to not make it run away if one player has like a temp one team has a temporary advantage but that would all be like interesting things to explore and uh it also involves a little bit of pve for scale right you'd have like ai controlled uh squads of of units that would be less impactful than enemy players obviously right and so you'd be a cut above those in terms of your power level but they could still maybe overwhelm you and certainly you could like coordinate with the ai controlled agents to like overwhelm a specific player's position or something right and so like there's all these really interesting things that in my head you could do that it would be really interesting to put the put the rubber to the road in that kind of analogy and see see what we can actually do with that so i do look forward to yeah. doing that eventually yeah, it would be epic. So I guess the last question that I had for CS is, 
I was curious about sp your thoughts on spraying. I know that you dislike the RNG, and I also do. <laughs> so that would be yeah. an easy, easy thing to remove if we uh, were to have those. But I was curious how you feel about all the, like basically the way CS has spraying, where uh, it not only has like vertical and horizontal like jumps or whatever, but it also has like a visual like shape pattern. It's like mm. this complicated thing that you have to trace and remember. How do you feel about that? What it, What are your thoughts? I think it would probably be more interesting if the... Uh, so in Halo, they kind of hint at this in a few areas where the reticle kind of tells you the spread of the shotgun is like one of the examples. So they actually have different crosshairs for each gun that they have in the game. And the crosshair for the shotgun kind of indicates the spread of the projectiles. And that, that that's kind of interesting to me. I think that's probably the angle I would go for where if there was going to be a spray pattern where you have an automatic weapon and it shoots in some sort of pattern... Uh, the, the reticle would actually be different per gun and the reticle, the crosshair would indicate to you, Hey, uh, like there's like a series of dots. And then you might've noticed as you spray that, like it goes clockwise, for example, like it goes from like top middle to the, like around in a, in a clockwise direction and then loops back up to the, the top middle again. And th so like, say every, I don't know, every 12 shots, you're back to where you started. And so like, if you can kind of figure that out, then you can adjust your, your aiming uh, accordingly, but it's like consistent with something that is visibly on your screen. And presumably if there was like an esports scene and a spectator scene, they would also have the same reticle as whoever they're spectating. And so they would actually see them following the, the, the spray pattern just based on that. And then you'd be able to intuit it. It's like a big problem for sprays is like I said earlier, you can't really know that that's happening. <laughs> and, uh, so it's really hard to explain how impressive it was. And so I would like that to be a little bit more obvious. I'm not sure that we would have recoil in the same way anyway, but like, I kind of think instead of having, instead of balancing it through recoil, you can probably balance something through fire rate and time to kill. Like CSGO can't do that because one bullet can kill you from pretty much any mm. gun, depending on the situation. Yeah. So if you have the time to kill be a little bit higher so that battles could take longer, then suddenly just the fact that my gun shoots slower means that that might be enough and I don't have to have any spray at all. Um, still it can be kind of interesting. Like you implemented a siren rework recently that makes them shoot a shotgun blast and like those kinds of patterns, like the, what the paladin does at the offsets with its skyfall ability and, and whatnot can be interesting and you yeah, know, yeah. mentioned LLs and all this other stuff. So I think that can be really neat. Um, how do you I, feel about the, like when a game has like a damage range, uh, so damage penalty, depending on the range basically is what it is. So like the damage fall off, I guess. Yeah. Um, I do think that's something we would want to. I feel like there's a va there is value in that because it basically means like there's two things that I feel about that. The first one is if you do some crazy trick shot and but you happen to be far away and you don't get the kill, that kind of feels bad because you just did something like a low percentage play, but maybe you were really precise or maybe you got lucky, whatever. Um, I also think though that with the damage fall off, what it does allow you to do is it forces you to enter into an area, an arena where you can actually be attacked back. And so it adds counterplay to fights instead of you just spamming uh, shots or whatever, right? It's especially the case if we end up not having infinite, like if we have infinite ammo, so we don't have to have like a ammo penalty. I'm not sure how I feel about that yet. Like I, I would need to know the roster of weapons that we have before I make that determination. Uh, or, or I would at least need to have some of the, the details on that nailed down before I decide. Yeah, yeah. But if we have infinite ammo, then there's no penalty to spraying besides the fact that you eventually have to reload or whatever. I do think as a general rule in FPS games, if you have to reload, probably have infinite ammo. And if you don't have infinite ammo, probably don't have to reload. Just like those, those, that kind of thing that I kind of think about it in those terms. CSGO has both. Yeah, I mean, but I, I feel like you could even combine those where like some weapons are just like your standard weapons that you just always have, the tools that you equip yourself with. And then you could have like some power uh Power weapons, weapons yeah. that you pick up where they are like oh you have a rocket launcher and you have free rockets that you can yes use yeah whatever. and so then it's it could be then you maybe you don't have to reload but again the shot the time between shots is paced enough that you can't fire all three of them super quickly or whatever and then you know the weapon is discarded at that point right like that's kind of an interesting dichotomy to, to be able to pick from i think yeah sure yeah so. okay that's great yeah, so what I thought about spray patterns is that uh, if we would even have them, I would probably prefer to them to be rather simple, where they are just like straight up 
vertical kicks with some like horizontal variation instead of being like shaped like uh, like in CS. But I don't know. Well, at it's least if the shape that... was like consistent and maybe symmetrical would be a good word to describe it. Like in CS, they're yeah. just like really weird fucking fish hooks or whatever. <laughs> it's yeah, really yeah. hard to commit them to memory, and some of them are actually very different. So. Yeah, and I guess the another ideal thing is have the have the kick be reflected on crosshair uh, mm. fully instead of it just being like fifty percent follow up and the rest is like implied by uh, like just something you have to learn, I guess. So yeah. just the way that like crosshair is always where the bullet shots basically, so it kicks your crosshair. Uh, precisely i guess yes that would be something i would i would want to have well that's that. that's how quake right. is too in some ways it's like w the bullet goes towards where your crosshair is and i think that that level of precision is like the best way to do an fps because it's the easiest it's way to understand it, right? yeah. yeah i mean if you have bullet drop off because like it's a mortar shot or something it's like a special weapon you can remember that for that one weapon or something right or that those kinds of weapons and that's like a little bit different i right? like the bullet like drop you have bullet drop and it, it, it'll it just, like, hit the ground slightly below where you shot or something, depending on the distance. Yeah. Like, you can kind of arc that, and that could be a skill to remember and stuff. And that, that's neat, right? But Actually, that reminds me of how, like, some games handle sniper rifles. Some are really bad where they will just add you, like, really annoying, like... Well, it's not, it doesn't even have to be drop, thing. like, vertical drop. It can be, like, wind drift or whatever the fuck. <laughs> like, yeah. Or you great. could do that, yeah. But also, when you're dealing with projectiles, that also means it takes time. Yeah. Uh, so you can like movement, uh, like you have to predict the movements. So. I like the, I like the predicting movement from longer range thing. That's that in some ways is probably safer than, or more sane than bullet, uh, like damage fall off. Because if you have to account for it with skill, then it can already be fine. Right. Maybe you don't need the damage drop off then, but I'm also fine with damage drop off. I think as a concept, it's just like. Obviously, it's just another stat that you have to apply to each weapon, and that can yeah. Be and the weird thing things, is right? that it's linearly applying, so it like will have different break breakpoints for different weapons. Even That's what I'm saying. Yeah, like the op yeah. doesn't have a fall off a nearly of as much compared to like the Deagle or the M4 or whatever, and it's like yeah, 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 like that definitely gets confusing. It's like oh, I dinked him from like you know long while well, i did 30 damage <laughs> it's like okay well thanks yeah. it's like compared to a deagle shot or an op shot which deagle probably kills him the op probably definitely kills him like it just gets silly so i don't know the i more think things are immediately visible the better probably yeah so. yeah i think so as a general rule so yeah. you can at least chase that as a design rule and, and even if you don't end up getting to it it's still good to make steps towards that direction probably so at least makes you think well, a little I bit think more. I think it was a pretty great episode. We covered yeah. RTS combat pacing. We covered a lot of... Uh, we covered all the questions. We covered some progress. And we covered some interesting FPS stuff, too. So, yeah. A yeah. little taster pretty. for those who are still around in, like, five years when we make Heaven Sense. So. <laughs> Man. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's good stuff. And you know what? Next time, we're going to be in episode 10, double digits. So, hope you guys are looking forward to that. Uh, and, as always, it's uh, it has been a pleasure. So let's get out of here on a high note yeah, and let's, uh, let's catch up to PPT and have six, episode sixty nine soon. So yeah, <laughs> we'll see how far it. Uh, yeah, eventually we can overtake that uh, masterpiece of a podcast. Uh, I will. <laughs> say, I will say the the early episodes of Crow's Nest way better than the early episodes of Big Boy's Table. I definitely. Yeah, that's you know uh, that's definitely very different. But all right, I think that'll do it for us then. And thanks for hanging out. Thanks for supporting us on Coffee if you do. And uh, if you're gonna, then thanks you again as well. And thanks for joining the Discord server and contributing to our lovely chat. And I will see you guys later. Yeah, see ya. I can't wait to play with someone, some of you in CMBW. So yeah, let's do it. Bye.